It was March 2008, and I found myself making my usual rounds as a truck driver, delivering cargo to remote locations across the U.S. This time, I was assigned to a forested area in eastern Oregon, and for once, I felt a certain excitement about the job. My name is Donovan Hendricks, and it had been nearly six months since I last delivered a shipment to such a picturesque location. The novelty of being surrounded by nature usually made for a pleasant change of pace. Driving along the winding roads that snaked through the dense pine trees, the sweet scent of vegetation thick in the air, I suddenly came across an unusual sight. A row of barbed wire fences stretched alongside the road, seeming to protect a large swath of land hidden beneath a cover of trees. As curious as it made me feel, that too had its charm. What on earth could be so valuable or dangerous to warrant such an extensive security measure in the middle of nowhere? Just then, my mind went into overdrive as an idea slowly formulated. Hey! Maybe there's buried treasure out here. I chuckled to myself, knowing better but feeling momentarily like the protagonist of my very own adventure movie. By late afternoon, the sun hung low in the sky as I reached my drop-off point, an old abandoned logging camp with dilapidated cabins and machinery scattered throughout. Quickly realizing that this spot must be part of my client's property, hence the elaborate fence system, I couldn't help but wonder what they were planning to do with all this land. Unaware that any troubles lay ahead, I carried on with my work routine as usual. Within mere moments, however, everything changed. As I loaded off my cargo near one of the old cabins, I caught sight of a figure watching me from within. At first glance, he appeared to be an ordinary man wearing ragged clothing. However, looking closer revealed a deeply off-putting visage. The man radiated an unnerving and sinister energy, allowing a malevolent glint in his dark eyes to distort his ragged features further. Deeply scarred flesh across his cheek and an unnaturally twisted smile heightened my anxiety. My heart pounded ferociously in my chest as the man began to step out of the cabin with slow, intentional movements. I tried my best to stifle the panic that surged through me when he produced a large and gruesome-looking axe from behind his back. Hey, can I help you? I stammered, unable to halt the torrent of adrenaline coursing through my veins. Still, no response came from him not even a hint of acknowledgement. In an attempt to put some distance between myself and this terrifying figure, I cautiously backed towards my truck with one eye still fixed on him. Unfortunately, this also put my cargo loading plans on hold, which eventually led me to make the heartbreaking decision to call for help over the radio. As I nervously explained my predicament over the airwaves, the urge to laugh at my own absurdly childish situation nearly overwhelmed me. It was hardly unusual for truckers working remote areas in this day and age to encounter ruffians hadn't I seen enough movies about highwaymen. And yet, deep down, something felt inexplicably different. If only they could see what I'm up against right now. I joked with my dispatcher before breaking off in a hollow laugh. This guy looks like he's gonna turn me into his next piece. I received little comfort from those waiting on the other end of my plea. Hang tight. We'll have someone out there in about 45 minutes. I froze, waiting for the imminent arrival of help. In the meantime, the man with the sinister presence continued to approach me menacingly, each step as deliberate and painful as the one before it. What do you want? I asked, trying to mask my terror. Still no response or change in his expression. In desperation, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. As quickly as I could, I relayed my location and the situation to the operator, 
who assured me that the police were on their way. Minutes felt like hours as I kept an eye on the menacing figure. He strode closer and closer, his twisted smile never leaving his face. The hand gripping the axe began to shake slightly, almost imperceptibly a threat unlike anything I had ever experienced. Suddenly, a siren's wail pierced through the tense air. The terrifying man stopped in his tracks, his eyes darting towards the direction of the sound. Police vehicles pulled up at breakneck speeds with officers piling out, weapons at the ready. Drop your weapon! One officer barked at the man. Reluctantly, he let go of his grip on the axe, letting it fall to the ground with a disheartening clang. As more officers streamed into action surrounding him, he seemed unfazed by their presence while he slowly raised his hands in surrender. They handcuffed him without resistance. As the police went about running checks and collecting statements from those nearby, I watched this unnerving figure from a distance. Even now, cornered and captured, he maintained that sinister aura, eyes still narrow slits filled with unquenchable loathing. One of the officers approached me for my statement. He revealed that they were familiar with this man's background, an ex-convict who had done time for particularly brutal murders involving victims' dismemberments using axes and knives. He had apparently just been released from prison weeks prior. I shuddered at the thought of what could have happened if help hadn't arrived so quickly. The officer extended his hand at me, offering condolences and promises for prosecution to the fullest extent of the law. That night I couldn't sleep, and for weeks afterward, any creaking in the darkness would send a shiver down my spine. The overwhelming sense of being watched by that twisted face made me keep one eye on my mirrors while working on those remote roads. In time, the days following that incident blurred together, as did the court proceedings. Life slowly continued on as it does, but I could not shake the feeling that, at any moment, I might encounter another glimpse of hidden evils waiting to pounce. Months later, I received a phone call from that same officer who had informed me about the horrifying events from that fateful day. He said that the man would not be leaving prison again any time soon. His previous crimes, paired with his menacing behavior and new attempted acts of terror had placed him securely behind bars for good. As afraid as I had been in those moments when faced with unimaginable horror, I knew now that there was no need to worry any longer. The misery this man brought on to others would finally come to an end. As life continued to move forward, slightly less burdened than before, every now and then, memories of him would resurface. Reminding me of how lucky I was to be alive and how vigilant one must be no matter where life might lead them. A simple job like mine can still be interrupted by unexpected terrors lurking in shadows. The crisp air of October 2013 greeted me as I climbed into my truck, ready for another day of work. I had been a truck driver for over a decade and knew the American highways like the back of my hand. My name's Ned Harrison, and this particular route took me through a remote area in the Allegheny National Forest, Pennsylvania, a route filled with endless trees on both sides of the winding roads. It was around 7.30 a.m. when my CB radio came to life, crackling with static before the voice of another driver cut through. Hey, Ned, did you hear about those strange happenings around these parts? I heard folks have been going missing. I rolled my eyes. Oh, come on, Davy. You know that kind of stuff always pops up once Halloween's around the corner. I'm serious he insisted. Anyway, I gotta run. Catch you later. 
That exchange was soon forgotten as I continued driving, focusing on my job and the hum of the engine. Everything seemed normal until I reached an isolated stretch of road. A sudden loud bang erupted from under the truck, and my heart leaped in my chest as the vehicle lurched. Damn it! I muttered as the truck sputtered to a stop. With no other options, I grabbed some basic tools and climbed out to inspect what had happened. The tire had been torn apart. It was beyond repair. Guess it's time for the spare, I sighed. As I worked to replace the destroyed tire, my thoughts drifted to what Davy had said missing people along this stretch of road. It certainly wasn't going to prevent me from finishing my job but it unsettled me nonetheless. Finishing up with the tire replacement faster than expected, I got back on the road and focused on reaching my destination without any further incidents or thoughts about mysterious happenings. Night had fallen as I continued, the moon casting her light through the dense forest, making the shadows look like they were alive. I rounded a bend and spotted something odd on the side of the road a seemingly abandoned car. The doors were wide open, and suitcases lay scattered nearby. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. It didn't feel like a breakdown scenario. Alert and cautious, I exited my truck and approached the abandoned vehicle. As I got closer, I could see dark red stains streaked across the seats and dashboard. The sight of it, combined with the unnerving silence enveloping me, churned my stomach. Hello? My voice rang out in the chilly night air. No response returned but my own echo. A wave of dread washed over me, but I was compelled to investigate further. Following a faint trail leading into the woods from the car's location, I ventured deeper, holding my flashlight steady as my heart pounded in my chest. A sudden movement caught my eye. There, among the trees, stood a man with a lit cigarette between his lips. He flicked it away as soon as our eyes met. His figure was tall and lanky, too tall to be natural, and his face was obscured by shadows. One thing that stood out was his long fingers and abnormal reach of arms that seemed to just hang by his side. A distinct feeling of evil emanated from this strange man, sending shivers down my spine, a primal fear urging me to run for dear life. Instead of moving towards him or running away, I stood frozen in place. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my body refused to move. Realizing I had not brought my cell phone with me and couldn't call for help, a thousand dark scenarios played out in my mind. The man before me suddenly charged straight at me, and my reflexes finally kicked in. I bolted back towards the road, my heart hammering in my chest. Just as I reached my truck, the man appeared from the trees by the abandoned car. He waved one of his unnaturally long arms above his head, latching onto a protruding branch, and swung himself forward like a gruesome spider. Panic surged through me as I climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. I floored the gas pedal, speeding down the road as he pursued me on foot. The thud of his heavy steps mixed with the sound of snapping branches as he moved through the forest with blistering speed. With no desire to confront this dangerous man or understand his motives, all I could think about was surviving this nightmare. As I reached a curve in the road that led away from him, I felt a small wave of relief wash over me momentarily. Not realizing just how far ahead of him I was and not wanting to risk slowing down to find out, I continued driving for what felt like an eternity until finally reaching my destination a local police station. Bursting through its doors, I tried to recount my experience calmly, an abandoned car covered in bloodstains that hinted at awful violence, and an unnerving man who chased after me and seemed almost supernatural. 
The officers listened intently but didn't seem convinced that an exceptionally tall lanky figure could be responsible for several missing persons along that stretch of road. Some officers were dispatched to investigate the scene. Meanwhile, others focused on retrieving additional information off the abandoned car's registration and contacting family members linked to it. Hours passed and finally, one officer called me over. Mr. Reed, he began, his expression changing to concern. We went to the location you described, and we need you to come with us to identify the scene and also help us clarify the details. Feeling terrified but knowing I needed to cooperate, I agreed. They escorted me back to the woods where the blood-stained car still rested, bright police lights illuminating the area. As we approached, I noticed something hanging from a tree near the car, a body. A sickening sense of dread weighed on my soul as I observed its mutilation. The other police officers examined the area in silence, while I stood there unable to move or speak. The tragic events that transpired in that very spot created a permanent scar that surfaced with every mention of this dark part of human history. The chilling terror that took place in those woods was finally put to an end when they captured the unruly man responsible for a gruesome string of murders. His abnormalities turned out to be nothing but genetic abnormalities, but his rage and deadly intent were undoubtedly violent and real. Several more cases surfaced linked to this dangerous man during his trial and for each victim left behind unanswered questions or unfulfilled hopes for closure. As his crimes were exposed further, countless others mourned their lost loved ones whose lives were brutally taken by this sinister figure lurking in the shadows. It's chilling how one person, through monstrous actions, can create a lasting ripple effect in others' lives. It was September 2015, and all I could think of while driving my truck on a remote stretch in rural Montana was how long it had been since I last took a shower. My dispatch orders took me on a route that passed a dense forest that seemed to go on forever. The road felt desolate, and I had been alone on the road for hours. So, when I decided to pull over for a quick restroom break at one of those less frequented rest stops, I thought nothing of it. Little did I know that this decision would change my life. I'm Stanley Davenport, by the way, just an ordinary truck driver making deliveries across the country. The job can be pretty unglamorous at times like these, but it pays the bills and lets me see different parts of America. I parked my truck and headed to the restroom, hoping for some privacy in this isolated area. As I entered the facility, the smell hit me, a mixture of ammonia and something sweet and rotten that bothered me deep in my stomach. It smelled out of place here amongst the scent of the trees and fresh air. But nature called, and I continued toward the stalls. As I washed my hands afterward, I heard something outside that sounded like muffled sobbing. Concerned someone might be hurt, I stepped outside cautiously to investigate. Peering around the corner of the building, I saw her, a young woman about twenty years old with tear-filled eyes. Her blonde hair hung around her face like strings soaked in blood. She was kneeling next to a man who lay motionless on the ground. It was apparent immediately that he'd suffered fatal wounds. Hey! I shouted hesitantly, breaking their conversation's desperate whispering. Do you need any help? She looked up at me with terror in her eyes and nodded ever so slightly. I rushed towards her just as she screamed in sheer panic, looking beyond me. I barely had time to register what was happening when a colossal figure appeared from behind my truck, wielding a long, blood-caked blade. 
I barely managed to dodge the blow as the blade came swinging down with unstoppable force. It was then that I saw his face. The man seemed to be in his late forties. His features disfigured by countless scars, and his skin was a sickly pale yellow hue. The menacing figure towered over me by at least two feet. His forearms were the size of tree trunks, veins bulging with every movement. Run! I yelled at the young woman as I scrambled back from my assailant. He swung the blade again, intending to finish me off, but this time I managed to catch him off guard by throwing a rock at his face. Get away! I screamed at her, continuing to dodge his relentless attacks. With each movement, I focused on staying alive while also making sure she had enough time to escape toward my truck. Just when it seemed like we'd put enough distance between us and the monstrous man, all progress halted as he stomped on the fallen girl's leg, breaking it instantly. She screamed in agony and tried to crawl away, tears streaming down her face. I knew I needed to act fast or both our lives would end here. Pee please, she begged through her sobs. Help me. I knew there was no time to waste. Ignoring the pain in my limbs from dodging the attacks, I grabbed a nearby crowbar that had fallen from my truck during the commotion. Listen! I yelled to the young woman as she continued her futile attempts to crawl away. I need you to make your way to my truck. Grab anything that can help us against this guy. With a shaky nod, she began crawling again, ignoring the pain radiating from her shattered leg. Meanwhile, I kept my focus on the monstrous man and his dreadful blade. I'm going to lead him away from you. I shouted at her, making sure she understood the plan. Knowing that waiting wasn't an option, I threw another rock at the man's face to buy some time. As he reeled back in anger, I sprinted in the opposite direction, hoping he would follow. Luckily for both of us, he did. As I ran further away from my truck and the injured girl, my mind raced with possible escape plans and backup plans if things went wrong. I considered calling for help but quickly realized doing so would give away my location to the man pursuing me. I found myself at a construction site and hastily searched for something that could be used as a weapon or distraction, anything that might save our lives. Moments later, I spotted a container of gasoline near a generator. An idea sparked in my mind. After kicking the gasoline container over and spilling its contents across the ground, I sprinted back towards where I'd left the young woman and hoped that she'd managed to find something useful in my truck. As expected, when I reached her side once more, it was apparent she had been busy while the monstrous man chased me. She had managed to pull out a flare gun, something that might just tip this dire situation in our favor. In perfect timing, our attacker returned to finish what he'd started. Desperate, I grabbed the flare gun from the woman's hand and aimed it at the approaching behemoth. Back off! I warned him, to no avail. The man was relentless. So, I pulled the trigger without hesitation, sending a fiery blast directly toward him. The flare struck his face engulfing him in an unbearable blaze. His agonized screams resonated through the air as he thrashed about, blinded and seriously injured by the roaring fire now consuming his own flesh. He stumbled backward and fell onto the trail of gasoline I had left earlier, causing the fire to spread further, intensifying its wrath and engulfing him entirely. It wasn't long before what remained of our attacker was nothing but a burnt husk, lifeless and unrecognizable. With relief flooding my veins, I turned to the young woman, who was now clutching her broken leg in agony. We needed emergency assistance, fast. 
Only then did I dare pull out my phone to call for help. Paramedics arrived within minutes and tended to both our injuries before transporting us to a nearby hospital. During our recovery period, we spoke little of that traumatic event, both aware that such a nightmare was better left buried in the past. The one thing I knew for sure was that we, and all others likely targeted by this ruthless killer, could now breathe easier knowing that this monstrous man would never harm anyone ever again. And though either of us emerged from this ordeal unscathed physically or emotionally, we both took some small comfort knowing that we were survivors, and that we'd come out on the other side stronger than ever before. I've always appreciated the open road. There's something about just driving, getting away from it all that appeals to me. Back in June 2009, I was trucking down a long stretch of highway just outside of Ames, Iowa when I first crossed paths with my tormentor. At first, that particular day was typical. My name's Ethan Miller, and I'm a truck driver. I take pride in my job. It's honest work and allows me to see the world beyond the confinements of a regular 9-to-5 gig. Around noon, I pulled over at a dingy diner for lunch. You know the type. Warm linoleum floors, grease-stained napkin dispensers, and a waitress named Marge who wore a disarming smile. As I finished up my burger and fries, I overheard a conversation between two sheriff deputies about strange occurrences happening in the area, a string of brazenly committed crimes with no trace of the perpetrator. I dismissed this as idle gossip and went on my way. I climbed back into my truck with high hopes of reaching Nevada by tomorrow. My cargo that day comprised mostly fragile glassware heading west. Hours went by uneventfully as sun began to set. The scenery was pure serenity, miles of open fields peppered with trees covered in leaves turning various shades of golds and yellows. Suddenly, my truck failed. Frustrated but feeling up to the challenge, I hopped out and started inspecting the vehicle. After running through the usual checks, oil level, coolant temperature, tire pressure, I realized nothing appeared to be amiss. But then things took an unexpected turn for the worse. There on the ground beneath my left rear tire was a white streak, bone fragments and bits of flesh strewn across several yards of pavement. Panicking as scenarios raced through my head, I snatched up my CB radio to call for help. Then, a new voice crackled over the frequency a soft, sandpaper-like whisper that sent a layer of goosebumps across my skin. Ethan, don't you know it's not polite to leave your cargo unguarded? My eyes shot up, scanning the horizon on both sides of the highway. But I saw nothing beyond fields and a few sparse trees surrounded by darkness. What's the who are you? What do you want? I stammered, clutching my makeshift weapon, a tire iron. The only response was sinister laughter that rasped through the speaker, echoing out into the night air. As if on cue, headlights approached, cutting through the remaining daylight like a knife. The engine hummed in my direction before the car came to an abrupt halt just fifty feet from me. I could see him now, tall and slim with angular features. His eyes seemed to hold untold depths of malice as they flickered in the glow of his vehicle's headlights. He was dressed in dark clothes, and he clutched something shiny in one twisted hand. A metallic glint suddenly revealed it to be a knife slick with blood. The man began to approach slowly, deliberately stalking closer as a predator does its prey. I had no choice but to grab any useful items from my cab and flee into the wooded area sprinting alongside the highway. Every nerve screamed that he was still pursuing me. 
I could feel his presence like an itch between my shoulder blades, but I distanced myself from his hateful glare. My heart pounded hard enough that it felt on the brink of bursting out of my chest. Times like these make me wish I'd practiced running more than just driving. The trees blurred into streaks as I charged ahead carelessly trying my best to stay alive and not trip over stray roots or fallen branches. With my legs aching and lungs burning, I managed to find a momentary reprieve in a small clearing. Under the canopy of branches, I caught my breath and surveyed my surroundings, desperately searching for any sign of help. Thankfully, I spotted a small cabin tucked away among the trees. As I cautiously approached the structure, my mind raced with thoughts of who might live there and whether they could assist me in evading the relentless attacker. I hesitated at the door, but ultimately decided to knock, considering that this might be my only chance at survival. When the door swung open, an older man appeared, gazing at me with curiosity and concern etched on his face. What brings you here? You seem to be in trouble, he said, taking note of my disheveled state. I managed to stutter a brief account of what had occurred. Much to my relief, the old man invited me inside without question. He offered me some water and assured me that I could stay as long as needed. We'll call for help, he said firmly as he handed me a glass. We soon discovered an unfortunate obstacle. There was no cell reception in this remote area and the closest payphone was miles away. The cabin owner explained that he rarely needed to call anyone and hadn't bothered to install a landline. He mentioned the nearest police station wasn't too far. Perhaps we could go there early in the morning. His understanding demeanor provided solace as we exchanged stories late into the night. He had retired to this secluded place years ago after his wife's passing seeking solitude and simplicity far from the turmoil of city life. As morning approached, we prepared to make our journey toward the police station. Just as we were about to leave the cabin, something reflective caught my eye through one of the windows, an unmistakable glint creeping from behind a tree. Suddenly filled with dread, I realized that the knife-wielding attacker had found me. He had tracked me down with an unsettling tenacity, proving how sinister and determined he truly was. The old man could sense my unease and joined me at the window. The sight of the pursuer took him aback, his face paling at the mere sight of my relentless stalker. He quickly locked the door, and we decided it was best to wait for him to leave before attempting any escape. Minutes felt like hours before finally he disappeared from view. We crept out of the cabin fearfully but resolutely, never letting our guard down as we made our way to the safety of the police station. Upon arrival, we recounted the events in detail. I couldn't help but feel grateful for meeting a stranger who offered kindness and help when I needed it most. Authorities searched for the mysterious attacker, eventually apprehending a man who fit his description, deep-set eyes with malice lurking beneath, angular features casting sinister shadows on a lanky silhouette. In his possession was a blood-stained knife. As I continued my truck-driving job, never again did I leave my cargo unguarded or fail to call for help when it seemed necessary. Life moved forward, haunted by fleeting memories of that terrifying night. But amidst that darkness emerged the resounding reminder of the old man's selflessness, an example of goodwill triumphing against all odds. With time, the incident faded into obscurity, but those productive bonds stayed etched in my memory. Every so often while driving down a lonesome stretch of highway, nostalgia would set in sending me back to that fateful night and offering a haunting reminder that danger can lurk around any corner.
It was June 2017, and I was hauling a load of lumber to a remote construction site in the thick, wooded hills of Oregon. My name's David Costello, a seasoned trucker who considers life on the road an art, peppered with sarcastic jokes and late-night coffee shop stops. Sure helped pass the time in long, dark stretches like the one I was on that murky evening. I pulled up to the construction site around 9 p.m., after the workers had wrapped up for the day. The workers had left behind floodlights illuminating the makeshift office trailers and skeletal frames protruding from the freshly turned earth. As I climbed down from my truck to start unloading, I quipped to myself, Why can't they build a convenient deli just off the highway exit out here? Instead, I gotta face hunger while they build fancy vacation homes. Having hauled lumber for years, I developed an efficient system for unloading. That night was no exception as I moved quickly to finish my work. Then something caught my attention. Just as I lowered another plank to the ground, a distant rustling sent shivers down my spine. It wasn't out of the ordinary for wildlife to wander around construction sites looking for scraps. Still, there was something unsettling about this particular sound, almost like heavy footsteps mingling with sharp scratching noises. The sound grew closer and louder despite my feeble attempt at ignoring it and continuing my work. Hey, I yelled into the darkness. Anyone out there? No response but silence. I unloaded a few more planks until suddenly, an ill-fitting burst of laughter slipped into my ears from afar. All right, I grumbled reluctantly as beads of cold sweat crept down my neck. Time to see what's going on. Picking up a hammer from my truck bed to defend myself if necessary. As I moved toward where I thought the sound originated... I couldn't shake the feeling that my every step was being watched. The air grew heavy, and I could sense an unshakable presence lurking just out of sight. That's when I saw him for the first time. Through the veil of darkness and trees, what looked to be an exceptionally tall man emerged, wrapping his elongated fingers around a tree trunk to steady himself as he approached me. His dirty, tattered clothes hung from his skeletal frame, and his teeth appeared jagged like a washboard stretched out in a sinister smile. I froze in terror, unable to comprehend what I was seeing. The tall stranger staggered closer without a word, bearing a malicious aura so vile it rendered me speechless. Hey! I stammered, my voice trembling as I clutched the hammer tighter. W.H. What do you want? This is private property. He continued to lurch towards me like a sinister specter hunting his prey. Stay back. I warned him as panic swelled deep inside me. The stranger's hazelnut eyes locked onto mine and seemed to glaze over as he rapidly closed the distance between us. My heart pounded harder with each step he took forcing adrenaline through my veins as fear stifled my breaths. In a last-ditch effort to protect myself, I screamed for help, hoping that someone nearby would hear my cries. Help me, please! Somebody help! The tall stranger seemed undeterred by my screams and continued to advance. Desperate, I threw the hammer in his direction watching as it struck him squarely in the head. He staggered back a few steps, momentarily stunned but not defeated. Taking advantage of his momentary confusion, I turned and bolted back towards my truck, fumbling with my phone as I tried to call 911. Please pick up, I whispered under my breath. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the operator answered, 911, what's your emergency? Someone's attacking me. I'm at the construction site off Route 26. Please hurry. I managed to gasp. 
Stay on the line. The operator instructed as sirens wailed through the air. Help is on its way. I held my breath as adrenaline pumped through my veins and continued to run. Unexpectedly, someone grabbed me from behind. It was not the sinister stranger but rather one of my co-workers, Adam who had returned for a tool he'd forgotten earlier. Hey! What are you doing? What's going on? He asked in alarm because it was unusual for me to scream in panic. I babbled about the tall stranger that attacked me while still keeping an eye on where he had been earlier. Adam didn't seem to see him and tried to calm me down. I don't see anyone, he said cautiously. Did they leave? We should wait in the truck for help. He led me back to the safety of the truck as we waited for authorities' arrival. Moments later, police cars swarmed into sight with sirens blaring and officers rushing out of their vehicles. We got here as fast as we could, an officer said, approaching us with urgency. What happened? I recounted the chilling encounter with the tall stranger while the officer took notes and held up a hand to silence my co-worker, who tried interjecting with his disbelief that he hadn't seen anyone. The police then spread out among the trees, searching for any trace of the menacing attacker. Despite their efforts, nothing was found. The only evidence of his existence was embedded in my mind and my frantic call to 911. Even after I provided a detailed description of the tall stranger and his tattered appearance, the officers couldn't locate him or connect him to anyone in the area. It was like he vanished into thin air without a trace. As night turned to dawn, my co-workers arrived at work and news about my fearful encounter spread rapidly at the construction site. Many questioned me for more details, while some shared their theories about who this person could have been. Although unsure whether it was a sick prank or an actual threat to our safety, we were all on edge. Days passed, but no one saw the tall stranger again. The police deemed the case unsolved but kept a close watch on the site. My co-workers and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched as we went about our jobs. After thoughts of that horrific event still plagued me in moments of solitude. The image of his sharp teeth and sinister smile haunted me at times even though he was gone without leaving a single clue behind. As time moved forward, I remembered less about that chilling night until it became part of our workplace lore, a ghastly slice from our shared experience never repeated or explained. With every passing day, life returned to normalcy as we all carried on with our jobs. But deep within my heart, etched unnervingly in my memory will always be those malevolent eyes the mark left by one bone-chilling night that evaded reason yet never quite faded into oblivion. It was October 1995, and I found myself driving my old semi-truck along a remote stretch of road in Wyoming, trying to get a shipment delivered on time. My name is Russell Carson, and back then, I was a 31-year-old truck driver just trying to make a decent living. That day had started like any other, with me waking up at a truck stop, having some breakfast, and hitting the road. About an hour into the drive, something caught my eye off to the side of the road. There was a wrecked car with its hazards still blinking. I radioed for help and returned to my job before any guilt could set in. I chuckled to myself. I guess it's a good thing I'm not an EMT. Imagine how guilty I'd feel. The day progressed uneventfully as the sun began to lower in the sky. Eventually, I came across another vehicle stopped by the side of the road, a rusty pickup with the hood up. 
Again, I stopped and got out of my truck intending to make sure everything was okay. As I approached the pickup, I noticed something was off. There were deep scratches in the paint that seemed haphazardly strewn across the vehicle. Additionally, there were what appeared to be bloody handprints smeared on the windows. Unsettled but hesitant to assume anything too sinister from appearances alone, I called out to see if anyone needed help. But no one responded. Deciding not to stick around any longer than necessary, I returned to my truck and continued driving while making a mental note of where this curious scene had unfolded. As night fell and darkness enveloped the road ahead of me, I couldn't shake that eerie feeling from earlier. A few miles down the road, what looked like an overturned tractor trailer forced me to come to a screeching halt. Disgusted and unnerved, I exited my truck to examine the wreckage. Immediately, a foul smell engulfed my nostrils, prompting me to grab a rag from my pocket for some relief. The overturned trailer had been torn open and strewn about the site were various discarded cardboard boxes. I tried to make sense of what could have happened when suddenly, I heard a faint rustling behind me. Slowly turning around, I found myself face to face with a tall man in tattered clothes, or at least what remained of them. Hands smeared with blood and dirt hung limply at his sides, and his hair was matted and disheveled. The man's eyes were pure black, void of any visible whites or irises, conveying an unsettling presence of menace. Terror gripped me as the man charged at me with frightening speed. Survival instincts took over as I sprinted back to my truck with him right on my heels. Barely making it inside, I locked the door just as he slammed into it. Breathing heavily, I fumbled for the keys and started the engine. Managing to shift into gear while keeping my eyes locked on this terrifying brood outside my truck. The man began slamming his fists against the window in a frenzied rage bent on breaking through. Panic set in as I noticed cracks forming in the glass. Revving the engine, I sped away from that horrifying scene as fast as possible crashing through debris on the road. My heart was pounding so loud within the confines of the speeding vehicle that I couldn't hear anything else. By sheer luck or providence a police cruiser came into view up ahead. They must have been sent to investigate all the accidents along this remote strip of road. I flashed my high beams and honked repeatedly until I caught their attention. In the flickering red and blue lights of their cruiser, I caught one last glimpse of the deranged man. His hollow eyes stared and bore into my soul. Though it was becoming smaller and more distant with every second that passed. As the police cruiser followed me, I continued driving at breakneck speed, trying to distance myself from that monstrous man. The police officers radioed for backup, and soon we were part of a small convoy with two more squads joining in. They escorted me to the nearest police station for my safety. At the station, I spoke with Detective Jones, giving him every detail I could remember about my ordeal. He assured me that they would search the area thoroughly for any signs of the man who had pursued me. As they gathered a team to investigate the scene of the attack, I sat in the waiting area feeling a mix of fear and relief. The detective later informed me that they had discovered nothing unusual at the site or any trace of the man who chased me. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. They did, however find evidence of a makeshift campsite nearby, suggesting that someone had been living there for some time. Detective Jones interrogated me further, asking if I knew anyone who could harbor such malice toward me or anyone who appeared unstable in recent times. I had no answers for him. It seemed utterly random and terrifying. After giving my statement at the station, I called my best friend Tom to pick me up. He arrived shortly after and asked if I was okay. 
I didn't respond. I just wanted to go home. No one understood why that man targeted me or what his intentions were. And as much as it scared me, I couldn't help but feel bad for him too. Overwhelmed by exhaustion and terror, sleep finally claimed me once Tom drove me back home to safety. For days afterward, a lingering sense of dread hung over me like a thick cloud. Everywhere I went or whatever I did was basked in anxious sweat. One evening while watching TV, the news broadcast covered a gruesome murder outside an abandoned warehouse not far from where my encounter had taken place. A victim was found mauled to death, claw marks covering their body, and a terrifying message written in blood splayed over the warehouse walls. I am still here. My heart clenched. I couldn't help but think that the man who had chased me was responsible for this brutal murder. Yet, Detective Jones assured me that they would not rest until they caught the culprit. He promised to keep me updated on the progress of their investigation. Tom and Jennifer, my close friends, did everything they could to help me cope with the trauma. They stayed with me in turns to ensure I was never alone sometimes even joining in for dinner or a movie night to lessen my burdening stress. As the days turned into weeks, authorities found no new leads or clues. The horrifying villain who hounded me during that fateful night seemed all but missing from this world, haunting my every thought as I pieced together what could have happened to him or why he had chosen me as his victim. Eventually, Detective Jones updated me on their progress, or lack thereof, one last time before sharing my condolences and assuring that he would continue investigating until he found answers. It wasn't much comfort knowing that the bloodthirsty man could still be out there hunting other people. Over time, memories of the horrifying encounter began to fade and lose their power. My friends stayed by my side through it all reassuring me that we had each other's backs through thick and thin. Though life returned to normal for us all, we spent our nights together eating pizza and laughing over silly jokes. I learned never to take anything for granted again. For someone out there indeed have lost a loved one due to a senseless and gut-wrenching act much like the one that nearly claimed my life too. Who knew how many other countless victims there were? or even what horrors awaited them in those final moments before meeting their gruesome end. Though I pushed those thoughts far away, they lingered at the back of my mind, a stark reminder that danger can appear out of nowhere, and that vigilance is the only barrier between life and death. It was November 2008, when I got a new assignment for my truck driving job. I'm Marty Jensen, and usually, my runs through the heartland are uneventful. The route was to collect lumber from Bentley's sawmill, hidden deep within a remote forest in Montana. Life on the road had started shaping me into a comedian of sorts much like an off-brand Chris Christopherson traveling through America one joke at a time. The drive through the narrow winding roads was slow and tedious. Upon reaching Bentley's sawmill, I realized how strange it was from any kind of civilization. I soon discovered that the place was even eerier than it initially appeared. A few workers were wrapping up their shift, covered in sawdust and sweat as they loaded my truck with lumber. Odd things have been happening around here lately, said Frank Walsh, a worker who had taken a quick break to grab some water before heading home. I raised an eyebrow curiously. Odd how? Like squirrels eating your lunch odd? Frank chuckled but quickly shook his head, regaining his serious demeanor. Worse than that. Just last week, someone from our crew disappeared on the way back from work. Two days after, he was found mauled and disfigured near a couple of trees. 
I grimaced but forced out a small chuckle. You're just trying to scare the newbie trucker, huh? No joke this time, kid, Frank insisted gravely before walking away. That evening... As darkness fell upon the once serene forest now filled with creeping silhouettes of darkness, I parked my truck for the night outside the sawmill and crawled into my sleeping bag in its cabin. The following morning began normally enough untangling myself from my sleep domain and rubbing my tired eyes as I prepared to start another long day. Exiting my truck cabin, I noticed something off. Beside the truck was a large puddle of crimson liquid spilling out onto the muddy ground. A worker rushed over, eyes widening at the sight. What happened here? He stuttered, unable to hide the shock from his voice. We all exchanged inexplicable glances, a shiver creeping up my spine. I couldn't shake Frank's story from my mind. The next few days were unnerving. More incidents occurred equipment destroyed, trees slashed, and strange sounds during the night that echoed through the thick forest. Frank's colleague was found unconscious near a road with no recollection of what happened to him. This is insane! I yelled over dinner with a couple of workers in the modest Salmo canteen as we discussed the bizarre events. You're telling me! Earl thinks it's some guy with a vendetta against our boss, said one worker, adjusting his hat. He saw him? No, the worker shook his head. Just an insane theory based on all these incidents. I focused on the ground, thinking hard. It doesn't make much sense. What's he gaining from smashing up our equipment and hurting people? Silence filled the room as we looked at each other with concern etched on our faces. The following evening, while sitting in my truck cabin reading my favorite paperback thriller, I heard a sudden clang against its side. Peering out of my window into the darkness, I could barely make out a figure running away from my truck toward the dense woods. The figure was muscular, shrouded in dread and mystery. Fear gripping at my insides, I decided to give chase into the darkness against any sense of reason or rational thought. As I hastily ran through the forest following blurred movements all around me, I felt an overwhelming force push me to the ground and drag me along suddenly, yet somehow aware it wasn't uncalculated. With my heart pounding frantically, I desperately searched for my phone to call for help. But in the chaos of the chase, I realized that I had left it in my truck cabin. Stuck in this situation with no way to ask for assistance, I had no choice but to face what was happening on my own. The force dragging me through the forest finally stopped, and a man with a sadistic grin stepped into view. His tall, muscular frame towered over me like a giant. He was bald and covered in horrifying tattoos depicting violent scenes. His cold eyes burned with violent intent as he stared at me with an unsettling smile. I've been waiting for you, he whispered, his voice full of malice. He dragged me towards a makeshift cage made out of wooden logs and scrap metal an obvious sign that he had been planning this for some time. He tossed me inside and locked the door, leaving me trapped like an animal. The cage was surrounded by shattered equipment and the remnants of previous victims who weren't fortunate enough to survive their encounters with him. Found your trail easy enough, he taunted, referring to how he had discovered our operations despite being deep within the forest. But it's what I do find those who think they're alone safe in their solitude, and then take control. He paced around me, occasionally rattling the cage or swinging something sharp against its bars both acts meant to terrorize me further. It was clear that he enjoyed every second of my torment. For days, this sick individual tormented his unsuspecting victims by preying on their weaknesses. 
Despite my lack of options, I decided that I would no longer be his plaything. As night fell once again, I scanned my surroundings within the cage and desperately searched for anything usable as a weapon or tool to aid my escape. Amidst my anxiety-induced search frenzy, I spotted a broken yet sturdy tree branch lying close to my cage. Aware that drawing attention to my plan would be catastrophic, I moved slowly and cautiously. Inch by inch, I maneuvered the branch through the bars of the cage until I could direct its pointed end against the lock, prying it open. With bated breath, I made my move and stepped out of the cage. The chain around my ankle clinked loudly as I moved, alerting the man to my escape attempt. His furious growl echoed through the forest as he charged towards me. Running away, are we? He yelled, running full speed in my direction. With limited time and self-preservation kicking in, I picked up a nearby rock and hurled it at him with all my might. The rock struck his face, momentarily stunning him and providing me with a brief window of opportunity to flee. Running for dear life, I managed to lose him within the maze-like darkness of the forest. Making my way back to the sawmill, all I could think about was alerting others to avoid this monster lurking in our work area. Upon reaching the sawmill, panting from exhaustion and my adrenaline-driven escape, I frantically recounted everything that had happened to Earl and the others. They listened intently with increasing horror for every detail shared. Within moments, Earl rallied the workers together so that they could inform anyone remotely near our location about this sadistic psychopath. Regular shifts turned into search parties to prevent his reach from extending further into our community. While nobody else lost their lives during those terrible days, we were never able to catch him. He disappeared from our lives just as suddenly as he had entered them. Life at the sawmill started returning to normal after a while. However, we never forget what had happened or those we had lost because of that dementia-stricken individual. September 2012 My name is Hank Larson, and I am a truck driver. I frequently drive around remote areas of the United States, delivering cargo to isolated locations. One particular route took me deep into the heart of Nevada where cell phone reception was nothing but a myth. Every time I took this route, I retold some of my funniest stories to myself, trying to forget that unnerving scream in the woods surrounding the track last month. This time, as I approached a particularly dense forested area, I couldn't help but notice something unusual about it. Smoke was billowing out from inside the woods like a volcanic eruption on an island paradise gone wrong. Curiosity got the better of me, and I stopped, quickly deciding to step out and take a closer look at whatever was causing it. Carefully weaving my way through tangled foliage and ominous-looking trees, I found myself in front of the charred remains of a small cabin. What was left standing had been burned beyond recognition. It seemed like the inferno had taken place recently because the smoke still lingered and it was warm enough to feel it on my skin. Suddenly, movement caught my attention from behind one of the crumbling timber beams. A man emerged, covered head to toe in soot and ash. His hair was singed at the ends, his face barely recognizable with those haunting wide eyes. If it weren't for his tall frame and muscular build, he might have looked like a living corpse with his gaunt features. I stayed where I stood while he stared directly at me without uttering a sound. The entire scene gave me this uneasy feeling that something sinister was lurking behind his gaze but remained unknown for now. In an attempt to ease tensions after a long moment of silence, I said out loud to him with a half-hearted smile, 
Reminds me of when my uncle tried grilling hamburgers for us for the first time, except perhaps a little more intense. He remained motionless and silent, showing no signs of amusement at my joke. Suddenly, his face contorted into a twisted grimace, like he was battling some internal torment or pain. Just as swiftly, the sinister expression disappeared, replaced by something more akin to madness in his eyes as they seemed to skin me like a predator sizing up its prey. You shouldn't be here, he whispered in a raspy voice that sent shivers down my spine. I, I was just wondering what happened, I stuttered out, trying to remain calm but failing miserably. The man took a step toward me then, his movements unnaturally swift and smooth for someone so massive. On instinct, I matched his step backward, but clumsily tripped over my own misplaced footing. My heart was pounding. I knew I needed to get away from this man. He continued advancing, slowly gaining distance on me as I scrambled backward ungracefully through the forest foliage. Every time his foot hit the ground, it came down with an almost unnatural force that shook the very earth beneath it, not normal for a man of such slender physique. My breaths became short gasps as I struggled to keep distance between us, hardship growing apparent as the each passing second threatened encroaching darkness to swallow me whole. This is no place for you, he muttered venomously eyes blazing with malice as they locked onto mine once again. That sentence echoed within my mind as panic flooded my system, the fuel for adrenaline-enriched strength that allowed me to break into an all-out sprint in attempts of putting as much distance between him and myself as possible. Trees blurred into green streaks beside me while underbrush crunched beneath heavy footfalls signaling unbridled desperation coursing through blood vessels as though poisonous venom. Shots rang out behind me, bullets cutting through the air with a snap, ricocheting off of the trees. My mind raced as the madman pursued me, adrenaline urging me to move faster. How on earth did this twisted being acquire firearms of all things? I knew I couldn't outrun him forever, so I looked for a place to hide and potentially call for help. Spying a dense thicket nearby, I dived in, hoping the tangled branches would conceal my presence. My hands fumbled in my pockets for my phone as the gunshots continued, each one closer than the last. Finally, I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. My voice trembled as I whispered to the operator about my predicament and pleaded for help. She assured me that officers were on their way and advised me to stay hidden and quiet. The terrifying man was getting closer, his relentless pursuit marked by the sound of underbrush snapping beneath his boots. I held my breath fearing any sound would give away my position. He had an angular face with sharp lines and a hooked nose that stood out prominently. His unkempt beard harbored an unnatural darkness in the shadows it cast on his face. He wore rugged clothes with visible stains that spoke of a long nomadic existence. The gunshots abruptly stopped replaced by the man's raspy breathing as he scanned the area for any trace of me. It seemed as though he was searching not just with his eyes but with every fiber of his being, a predator seeking out its prey at all costs. Then I heard it, distant sirens wailing in response to my desperate call for help. The man heard them too. His gaze darted around momentarily before he snarled in frustration turned, and vanished into the forest like a ghost. Relief washed over me as I finally stumbled out from my hiding spot. Moments later, police officers flooded into the area, securing it while medical personnel tended to my scrapes and bruises. Overwhelmed by the events, I recounted everything that had happened, 
from the initial encounter with the man until his disappearance into the woods upon hearing the sirens. As the investigation proceeded, it turned out that they had been searching for him for a while. He was a wanted criminal who had been stalking and attacking innocent people in his mad rampage through the forest. There had been others like me, victims who had crossed paths with the sinister man. Some had made it out alive while others met horrific ends at his hands. When the officers questioned me about why I hadn't called for help earlier, I explained to them that fear had paralyzed me entirely when we first met. It hadn't dawned on me to consider calling for help until I was fleeing in blind panic and desperation. They understood but emphasized the importance of calling for help as soon as possible in similar situations. Knowing the monster wasn't some supernatural creature but rather a deranged man didn't alleviate the haunting memories of those traumatizing moments. My heart ached for those who lost their lives to his violent tendencies, and I hoped he would be brought to justice. Over time, the community moved on from this grisly chapter in its history. Although his reign of terror was cut short thanks to the quick response by law enforcement, it served as a stark reminder to remain vigilant. The police continued their search for him, determined to put an end to his senseless violence once and for all. With every passing day, life returned to normalcy. But those who encountered the man and will forever carry the scars of that experience with them. As we heal and grow stronger, we also remember those who were lost and hope that one day this twisted individual will pay for his actions, ensuring that no more innocent lives will be forever marred by his harmful presence. It was June 1996, and I had just finished joking around with my co-workers about our upcoming weekend plans. My name is Ellis Montgomery, an ordinary truck driver for a small logistics company based in a remote town in Oregon. Though I often found comfort in the solitude of driving through vast forests and desolate roads, something about the atmosphere of my upcoming route seemed daunting. The small dirt pathway that led me to my delivery site seemed nondescript enough, but the rancid stench of decay lingered in the air. It was almost as though the unsettling odor clung to my nostrils, suffocating me with each breath. Instead of letting it bother me, I attempted to brush it off as some sort of waste or rot from a nearby farm. Driving along the narrow road lined with tall trees casting ominous shadows on either side, I finally reached the drop-off point a seemingly abandoned construction site that looked like it hadn't seen activity in years. A sense of unease washed over me as I parked my truck and stepped out to assess the location. As I examined the seemingly innocent array of dusty machinery and rusted equipment strewn about, I suddenly felt watched from a distance. The once light-hearted jokes shared with co-workers hours ago now felt like distant memories as unshakable dread set in. Out of nowhere, I heard a faint yet distinct sound footsteps echoing in the distance behind me. My unease mounted as I turned to search for the person responsible but all I could see were empty surroundings enveloped by an eerie silence and darkness that seemed to press against me. The footsteps grew closer and louder until they stopped abruptly behind me. As I slowly turned around, my heart hammered in my chest as I came face to face with a man leaning against one of the rusted cranes at the site. Tall and lanky with harsh features distorted by shadow, his piercing eyes were void of any emotion, and his loose, filthy clothes seemed to be camouflaged in their surroundings. I didn't see the man's face clearly enough to identify him, nor did I care to. What do you want? I managed to choke out, wondering why he hadn't spoken. He made no verbal response. 
Instead, he extended his arm and pointed one long gnarled finger at an area slightly behind and to the left of me. It was clear he didn't have a rational intention for me. Curiosity getting the better of me, I turned my gaze towards where he was pointing and discovered a chilling sight a brutal display of what looked like mutilated animal remains had been arranged in a haunting pattern across the dirt floor. Panic set in as my mind raced, trying to piece together who this man was and what these bizarre acts signified. The truck driver instincts in me kicked in as I scrambled back towards my truck. Then it hit me the stench from earlier wasn't from a nearby farm. It was a subtle warning that had gone unnoticed. Frantically jumping into the cab, struggling with the lock, I looked up to see the sinister figure ominously walking towards my vehicle each movement slow and deliberate, exuding malice in every step. I didn't know how far or fast I could drive away from this deranged individual before he got too close. Come on Ellis, you've got this. I whispered under my breath barely able to hold laughter of delirium at my absurd joke as fear threatened to consume me. Hastily starting the engine just as the man reached my truck's side, adrenaline coursing through my veins stronger than ever, with terror fueling every move as I sped away with reckless determination. My tires screeched as I tore down the road, desperately trying to escape the menace that seemed to inch closer. Every second was crucial. I finally grabbed my phone and called 911 hardly able to string together a coherent sentence. Please, you've got to help me. There's a man. He's after me. I gasped into the phone. As I sped away from the nightmare-inducing sight of the man slowly walking toward my truck, I took turns without really knowing where they led. All that mattered was putting as much distance as possible between myself and him. A high-pitched scream split through the night air, causing my foot to slam on the brakes. The sound was horrifying, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. The scream appeared to come from just ahead, but my mind urged me not to seek answers. Instead, with a shaky hand clutched around my steering wheel, I tried plotting a course around the source of the noise. But it was too late. Without warning, the figure emerged in front of my truck again. The hair-raising grin plastered on his face seemed to reveal an intense pleasure in this twisted game of cat and mouse. My heart pounded in my chest as I heard sirens approaching in the distance perhaps help was arriving? Maybe there was still hope. Yet even as police cars whizzed past me and surrounded the man, there wasn't time for relief. The officers stepped out with their weapons drawn, yelling a series of commands at the deranged individual. He paused briefly but quickly returned to his depraved display by lunging onto one of them and sinking his teeth into their throat. Horrified screams filled the air around us again as more officers tried in vain to subdue him. As chaos and bloodshed erupted around me, I realized that whatever happened next might be far worse than what those mutilated animal remains had warned me about earlier that day. Desperate to escape the horrifying scene, I punched the accelerator again and raced to the nearest town. With a trembling hand, I knocked on the door of a resident's house, praying they would offer help. The door creaked open, and I was met by an older couple immediately asking what had happened. As I recounted the night's events, with barely enough coherence for them to understand my franticness-inducing tale, they let me in and locked their door behind us. I think it's that lunatic who escaped from the mental hospital last week, the husband whispered to his wife as they urged me to sit down and catch my breath. Finally safe, I collapsed on their couch moments away from passing out when I heard sirens approaching in the distance once more. Is this ever going to end? I thought to myself, 
hopelessness was beginning to creep into my consciousness. But instead of wallowing in it, I forced myself to stay alert, listening to the distant sounds of sirens puncturing the tense silence in the room. As dawn broke, one of the officers approached us with an update. We've apprehended him. He won't be harming anyone else. Although relief washed over me like a wave, I couldn't help but feel sorrowful for those lost in the gruesome endeavor, especially that brave officer who died trying to save my life. Shaken and scarred by that nightmare ordeal with the mysterious man whose motivations were never revealed nor understood, my days as a truck driver disappeared into a rearview mirror cluttered with memories of mutilated remains and piercing, emotionless eyes. One frosty March morning in 2016, I was driving my usual route from Austin to Dallas, Texas. That morning, I distinctly remember feeling a sense of calm and serenity as the sun gradually began to rise above the rolling hills. My name is Zev Clayton, a truck driver with over 15 years of experience on the road. I've run into all sorts of interesting characters, but never anything that could have prepared me for what was about to occur along the remote highways of East Texas. The first hint that something was amiss happened just outside the small town of Rockdale, where my truck's bold tires smashed through an unrecognizable pile of thick red sludge on the roadside. The stench was unbearable and putrid enough to leave an aftertaste in the back of your mouth like spoiled milk. As I continued my journey northward past the eerie site, I called my buddy and fellow driver Zeke over the radio. Hey Zeke, have you ever encountered something so foul-smelling while on a route? I joked reluctantly. Zeke chuckled in response. Zev, that's nothing compared to the time I accidentally drove over a skunk in North Dakota. Hearing his laughter made me feel better about the situation. Several miles later, however, my mood shifted dramatically when I noticed a strangely unfamiliar figure standing close to the road ahead. As I got closer to this person dressed in disheveled clothes covered in dried stains of unknown origin, it became clear that this individual had no intention of hitching a ride or seeking help. I couldn't help but observe that his appearance seemed less than human. His emaciated frame caused his clothes to hang off him like rags on a scarecrow. What unsettled me even more was his face, or lack thereof. There appeared to be no discernible features. Instead, an eerily smooth surface stared back with a blank emptiness that somehow seemed menacing and sinister in nature. My heart raced faster with each passing second, as I decided it was best not to stop despite my curiosity and concern. As the truck continued down its path, leaving this nightmarish figure behind, I couldn't shake the overwhelming sense of dread growing within me. For hours, I drove down uninterrupted stretches of highway. No matter how fast or far I went, the sense of foreboding wouldn't leave me. Suddenly, a bony hand slammed against my truck's window out of nowhere, leaving me in shock. The ghastly figure had inexplicably caught up to my truck and loomed over me with a twisted expression of malevolence. Panicked, I tried to radio Zeke for help, but instead of his voice, all that came through was an unidentifiable scraping noise, like a mixture between nails on a chalkboard and the guttural roll of thunder. I sped up, trying to put as much distance between me and the figure as possible, but it seemed no matter how fast I went, it was always just behind me. Through my peripheral vision, I could barely make out the horrifying visage of the villain. Without a clear path of escape, I picked up my cell phone and dialed 911. My hands were trembling so violently that I almost dropped the phone. 
911, what's your emergency? The operator asked. There's someone chasing me while I'm driving my truck on Route 50. It's terrifying. It doesn't even seem human. I stopped, adding hesitantly, Please help me. The operator responded urgently. We're dispatching a patrol car to your location. Please stay on the line. I clung to my phone as if it was my lifeline and drove faster. My body tensed every time the bony hand slammed against my window. Desperation gripped me how could I escape. Fortunately, just moments later, in the distance, I saw red and blue lights beginning to close on us. As they approached rapidly, relief flooded through me help was finally arriving. My relief turned to horror as the figure effortlessly reached out its long arms and grabbed the approaching police car by its hood. With terrifying strength, it threw the vehicle clear off the road before chasing me once more. Instantly brought back into a state of high alert, I radioed any nearby drivers for assistance. Anyone out there? Please help. There's something following me. It just destroyed a police car. A voice crackled over the radio in response. It sounds like you're in big trouble. Let's see what we can do to help. Soon after, two trucks sidled alongside mine from opposite directions. In perfect synchronicity, they formed a triangle formation around my truck. Forget about looking back. One of the drivers radioed. Just step on it. Keep driving straight, and we'll stay beside you. With our collaborative effort, we were able to outpace the monstrous figure for miles. At some point, it seemed to vanish as quickly as it had appeared. Exhausted, I finally stopped on the side of the road. The two other drivers came out of their trucks and approached me. That was intense, one said. Never seen anything like that before. We're lucky we all emerged unharmed. The other driver noted grimly. We called the police again to report the terrifying incident and moved cautiously toward where they had parked to provide the necessary statements. I barely held back the urge to shudder when recalling what we had just experienced. Given that our three trucks and cell phone records provided ample evidence of our encounter with that mysterious figure, our story was considered credible by law enforcement. Unfortunately, they were unable to track down the creature which had terrorized us on Route 50. The details of my encounter remained in forced silence as I continued my trucking career while watching nervously for any sign of the figure's return. Years later, I still can't shake what happened on that horrifying night. The moment I spot a lone figure at night time on a deserted stretch of highway, my heart starts pounding in fear. But every once in a while, on my long hauls, I find solace in knowing that two fellow truckers risked their lives to help me escape from harmed strangers who came together in the bleakest hour to fight an inexplicable evil. And through them, I also remember those who lost their lives or were injured during encounters with such nightmarish beings brave souls whose stories deserve to be remembered and honored always. It was June 2014 when everything changed for me. My name is Barry Lakes and I've been a truck driver for a little over five years now. You can say that trucking runs in my family my dad used to drive cross-country for work as well. The long hours on the road never really bothered me, plus it gave me the chance to see parts of America others only dreamed of. I was just outside Rapid City, South Dakota, transporting pallets of box snacks to be delivered way out in Oregon. The sun had slipped under the horizon some time ago as I barreled down the interstate. Sometimes, I found solace in driving late at night when there was less traffic on the road. 
The sky was painted with millions of diamond-like stars that stretched out into what seemed like infinity. As I rounded a sharp curve in the road, my headlights illuminated something strange ahead. A standard-sized sedan appeared to have veered off the road and crashed into a tree. Glass and debris were everywhere, and all airbags had been deployed. I pulled over to check if anyone needed assistance. As I got closer to the wreckage, I noticed streaks of blood strewn across the ground, but no signs of the driver or any passengers. Knowing someone could be injured nearby, I called 911 for help and tried not to imagine the worst. Waiting for emergency services to arrive felt like an eternity. The eerie silence soon became overwhelming as both my anxiety and curiosity grew steadily by the second. A soft rustling sound came from some bushes at the edge of the woods about twenty feet from where I stood, breaking into my thoughts. I cautiously approached it, hoping I'd find whoever survived this horrible accident so they could get help quickly. What happened next will forever be scorched into my memory. A man or what once was a man emerged from behind the foliage with movements that looked unnatural. His eyes were wide and bloodshot, pupils dilated to the point where only a thin ring of blue iris remained. His face was caked with dried blood, and pieces of flesh hung from his exposed gums where teeth used to be. What chilled me further was the fact he didn't say anything. No cries for help. No acknowledgement that I was even there. He began walking towards me with lurching steps that betrayed whatever injury had transformed him into this horror. Both arms hung limply by his sides, one hand crudely wrapped in dirty, bloodied rags. Panic seized me, and I rushed back to my truck to call the authorities once more. As I spoke to the dispatcher and kept my eyes glued on him, he continued his unsettling approach. Soon enough, he reached the verge of the road and positioned himself by the driver's side door of my vehicle. Do not open it, implored the dispatcher. Just stay on the line and keep watching him until we get there. Suddenly, he produced an angular piece of broken glass and began carving complex designs into his forearm. Seemingly unaware of the pain it must have caused as dark red blood dripped down his arm and pulled on the ground. It was revolting. The screech of tires pierced my ears as a police cruiser finally arrived at a breakneck pace. Two officers sprang out of their vehicle, guns pointed at the man in a sideways stance as they cautiously approached. The officers cautiously closed the distance shouting at the man to drop the piece of glass and get on the ground. Yet, he didn't seem to register their presence, continuing to carve patterns into his own flesh while staring blankly at me. Fear gripped me as I held on to my phone, the dispatcher still on the other end, whispering reassurances that everything would be all right. The officers were now mere feet from the man, and though their authoritative voices should have spurred him into compliance, the man refused to acknowledge them. Suddenly, the glass dropped from his hand and he reached for his crudely wrapped forearm. With a strength defying his tattered appearance, he ripped off the rags to reveal a brand new carving that left those who could see it gasping in terror. I could only stare anguished as one of the officers wrestled him to the ground, putting cuffs on his wrists. As if in response to his sudden confinement, the man let out guttural noises mingled with crude laughter, a horrifying cacophony that will haunt me forever. Amidst this grotesque display, backup arrived along with an ambulance. As they prepared a stretcher for him, I watched numb from my truck as paramedics assessed his self-inflicted injuries. Moments later an officer approached me with concern etched onto her face. Sir, she began hesitantly, are you all right? We'll take it from here. I don't understand, I stuttered. 
Was he after me? Why did he do that to himself? She shook her head but only replied, We aren't sure yet. It's possible a severe accident or trauma led him to this state. I knew something was off. It didn't make sense that this man was somehow unknown to everyone present, even those meant to protect us. Why weren't they telling me anything? As they loaded him into the ambulance, I resolved that tonight's events will remain a mystery best left untouched. I had called for help, but something deep in my gut whispered that this twisted tale was beyond any intervention. Reluctantly, I thanked the officer and retreated into my truck. As I drove away from the chaotic scene that had unfolded, I recalled the man's haunting stare, locking eyes on me until the very end. The terror crept up my spine, leaving me with a lingering dread each time I retold the story to family and friends in the days that followed. I never learned what had befallen the tormented individual, why he seemed fixated on me, or even his name. Though curiosity gnawed at my mind now and then, I feared dredging up something worse than that dismal encounter. Despite all this, one thing remained clear, for every terrifying memory etched into my psyche from that chilling night, there was the fact that someone had died just moments before I arrived on that lonely road. A traveler who, much like myself, hadn't known what awaited them in those hollow shadows. The victims of that night would forever haunt me, the unknown traveler who perished in an apocalyptic crash and the man mutilating himself in cold blood, their stories left unexplained and terrors unpursued. It reminded me of our precarious existence, an unfathomable game in which we can never predict when or how our number will be called. Driving my big rig along a lonely stretch of Highway 389 in northern Arizona back in May of 2019, I found myself whistling one of those familiar tunes that had no name. You know, the ones that always seem to get stuck in your mind for no reason. It was late afternoon, and the job had me long hauling fresh produce to a market several hundred miles away. My name's Eli Miller, by the way. Out here, civilization was far removed. Only the towering pine trees and occasional wildlife kept me company. Every few miles, I'd pass another driver on the road, and we'd acknowledge each other with a headlight flash or wave through our respective windshields. As dusk began to settle in, I stopped at a remote rest area to stretch my legs and empty my bladder. The rest stop appeared to be well-maintained but utterly deserted. Noticing some scattered trash bins and a worn picnic table, I decided it wouldn't hurt to eat my dinner there before continuing the long drive ahead. Just as I finished up my lukewarm ham and cheese sandwich, I noticed an odd skid mark on the pavement near my truck. At first glance, it seemed like your average strip of black rubber left behind by a heavy vehicle braking too hard, but what caught my attention was its uneven appearance with sporadic splatters of a dark, viscous substance. The skid mark jolted me out of my complacent reverie enough to pique my curiosity. I glanced around quickly for any sign of life before kneeling down to examine it more closely. Peculiar behavior was becoming quite routine between delivery routes lately. Suddenly, from behind one of the taller pine trees emerged a hulking figure, a man with unkempt hair and wild eyes that appeared to harbor nothing but malice behind their pale irises. His shabby clothing hung loosely off his gaunt frame, flapping silently as he advanced toward me. His mouth was twisted in a grotesque grin that seemed to widen with each step. Though I couldn't be sure, his shoe prints appeared disturbingly consistent with those surrounding the curious skid mark. 
My first instinct was to retreat to the safety of my truck's cab. Surely I could evade him there and, at the very least, buy some time to figure out what was going on. The few seconds it took me to scramble back inside and lock the door felt like an eternity. However, my 18-wheeler wasn't geared for quick getaways or off-roading through dense forestation for that matter, so I reached for my cell phone instead and dialed 911, hoping to report my harrowing predicament before it worsened any further. Static buzz from the other end of the line, but midway through relaying my situation, the call abruptly disconnected, leaving me in complete isolation. The shaky reception out here made it impossible to recall whether I managed to communicate my exact location before being cut off. As I frantically scanned my surroundings from within the now claustrophobic cabin, I caught glimpses of that same figure appearing between trees, sometimes closer than before. A distant rustling outside left an uneasy feeling gnawing at me as I realized this malicious individual had somehow circled around my truck while staying just out of sight. Gravel crunched underfoot as he crept ever nearer, fingers trailing against the rusted metal of my vehicle in a deliberate attempt to lure me out into his trap, or perhaps foreshadow whatever torture awaited me should I not comply. In sheer panic, I slammed my fist against the horn in hopes of startling him enough for an escape opportunity. The blaring sound from the truck's horn managed only to draw an ominous chuckle from the terrifying man, unaffected and still inching toward my truck. I knew I couldn't stay there forever, so I decided to risk it and make a run for it. Throwing open the driver's side door, I bolted from the truck and sprinted headlong between the trees, desperate to escape his grasp. My heart hammered in my chest as I heard him pick up speed behind me, sinister laughter echoing throughout the forest. Finding a fallen tree trunk, I darted behind it in an attempt to catch my breath and gather my thoughts. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I realized his laughter had ceased. He was waiting for me to unknowingly step into his reach. Despite being petrified, I knew I needed help. Even with the poor reception in this area, it was worth another try at calling 911. Panicked and trembling, I quickly attempted dialing 911 again while doing my best to stay hidden from view. Finally, there was a glimmer of hope when an operator's voice came through the crackling interference. Before I could explain where I was or what was happening, an icy hand grasped my wrist, snapping off at least one finger, while another hand roughly clamped over my mouth to muffle any cries. Pinned down by this malevolent man, he stared deep into my eyes with his pale ones as if trying to discern what actions would bring me the most pain. It took every ounce of strength not to scream out in agony when he dug his sharp and dirty nails into my arm and started dragging me across the forest floor. Unable to call out for help due to his vice-like grip over my mouth, tears streamed down my face as we ventured further from any chance of rescue. My entire body trembled with fear and revulsion as I struggled to make sense of the horrific situation unfolding. It felt like hours had passed when we finally stopped, and I realized we were near a poorly made shelter constructed of tree branches and leaves. My captor released his grip on my mouth to tie my wrists together with rope but kept my arm tightly pinned between his fingers, his sick grin sending uncontrollable shudders down my spine. Gathering my remaining courage, I thought of other people who might have fallen prey to this man and needed help too. Mustering a shaky voice, I pleaded with him to let the others go if there were any. He cocked his head to the side and regarded me for a moment before responding with nothing more than a sneer. Disgust washed over me as it became clear that he was toying with me, perhaps simply reveling in my palpable fear. In desperation, I mentioned the police call and assured him they were already on their way. 
It was an empty bluff, hoping against hope that it would deter him from inflicting any further harm on either myself or any other victims he may have taken captive. My words seemed to anger him for a split second, his face becoming dangerously close to snarling, but almost immediately morphed back into that twisted grin in what could only be perceived as an incredibly unsettling challenge. Before anything else could happen, the blare of sirens shattered the tense silence around us, rapidly approaching through the trees followed by several police officers armed and ready for action. My captor's grip slackened out of surprise or fear, allowing me to pull away from him just enough so that the officers could grab hold of him, forcibly restraining him as he thrashed wildly. It was nothing short of a miracle that they had found me when they did, Later on, after reuniting with family in terrified relief while others processed and detained the man who had terrorized me, it was revealed that they had picked up the call's approximate location from my earlier attempt to reach out for help. I'm painfully aware of how lucky I am. But what haunts me now, as I try to come to terms with the ordeal, is the thought of those who didn't make it out. Those who didn't have the same miraculous rescue and who had suffered at the hands of this horrible man. It may take a lifetime to honor and remember them, and while horrifying memories may eventually fade, their names must never be forgotten. It was November 2008. I was driving my truck deep in the dense Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. My name is Stuart Clements, and though I'm just a regular truck driver, my route took me through some of the most remote corners of the United States. Ha, huh, this road seems narrower than usual. I muttered under my breath as the trees seemed to close in around me. The whole forest seemed eerily quiet today. No birds chirped, and the only sounds were my truck's tires on gravel and leaves rustling in a brisk wind. I shrugged off the sensation, though. Forests can look pretty bizarre when you're constantly hauling cargo and losing sleep. Lost in thought, I almost didn't see him not cold feet away was a figure in a tattered and bloody shirt leaning against a tree just off the road. I slammed on my brakes and jumped out of the cab. Hey, are you all right? I called out to him. But he didn't reply or move an inch. Arms crossed over his chest. He stood there motionless with his head tilted downward. It seemed as if he was less a living human being and more an oddly placed mannequin dressed to blend into the wilderness. Tentatively approaching him from behind careful not to breathe too loudly I tapped his shoulder hoping to bring him back to life. Suddenly spinning around while letting out an ear-splitting scream, he startled me. Whoa! Easy there! I yelled as I fell backward onto the forest floor. As I picked myself up, my eyes grew wide at the sight before me. His face appeared horribly injured beyond any reasonable explanation. What happened to you? I whispered, utterly horrified by such grotesque injuries. His lips quivered but didn't make a sound. He glanced around nervously his eyes filled with fear like a hunted animal before sprinting toward me, something glinting in his hand. Nearly on top of me now, he snatched the keys from my shaking hand the sharp end of a knife against my throat. Please don't. I choked as I stared down at a badly cut smile gouged across his face. But it was as if he couldn't hear me. His eyes darted back and forth, seeming to settle on something behind me. An unforgettable scent was making its way toward us, a putrid combination of iron and rotting flesh. Fearful to even look, I glanced back anyway and saw a man coming closer. He had shoulder length, greasy hair and an unkempt beard, wearing duty boots covered in filth. 
In one hand, he held an obscenely large bloody meat cleaver. In the other, what appeared to be human entrails dangled morbidly. The injured man backed away, pulling me with him like some kind of shield. All I wanted to do was get away from this terrible situation. There had to be some way out. As the attacker approached us, frothy saliva dribbled down his chin while blood-coated fingers gripping his grungy weapon tightly. His bloodshot eyes locked onto us with clear, murderous intent. An idea popped into my head, if I could somehow signal someone else passing by for help. No. Standing here waiting for a miracle meant certain death. I'll give you anything. I screamed as the man with the cleaver advanced further. Just stop right where you are. In an instant, he stopped dead in his tracks. It was as if time stood still. My heart pounded against my ribcage threatening to burst out of my chest as we stayed locked in this stalemate that felt like eternity. Seeing the cleaver-wielding man stopped in his tracks, I knew I had to act fast. The injured man's grip on me loosened a bit, and I took the opportunity to push away his arm with the knife. He stumbled back, surprised by my sudden movement. As I sprinted away from them both, I called out desperately for help. Help! Somebody, please! My voice echoed through the empty streets, but no one seemed to hear or even care. I continued to run without looking back, trying to find a busy street or someone who could assist me in this nightmarish situation. My legs felt like lead, but the terror coursing through me forced me onwards. As I turned a corner, I saw a group of people up ahead and relief washed over me for a second. But suddenly, I felt a tight grip on my arm. It was the injured man again. He had caught up to me. His eyes burned with panic and anger as he dragged me back in the direction of the approaching man with the cleaver. No! Let go of me! My pleading only made him yank harder on my arm. It felt as if he was going to pull it right out of its socket. It was apparent that he would use any tactic necessary to escape our attacker while sacrificing me in the process. Our desperate struggle continued as the cleaver-wielding man closed in on us. He towered over us with unhinged fury preparing for an almighty strike down with his weapon when suddenly a police siren pierced through the air. The cleaver's descent came to an abrupt halt midair as all three of us paused, turning our heads towards the source of the sound. A police cruiser rounded a corner and came screeching towards us in full throttle. The injured man released his death grip on me and bolted down a dark alleyway. The man with the cleaver took off in the opposite direction. Panic-stricken, I froze on the spot, unable to process the whirlwind of events that had just unfolded. Finally, as the flashing red and blue lights pulled up beside me, I collapsed onto my knees, silent tears streaming down my face. The officers jumped out of their car, guns drawn. They quickly assessed the situation and split up to chase both assailants. Another officer approached me and began asking questions about what had happened. I recounted the terrifying experience to him as he took notes. Even after being assured that the police would do everything they could to track down these dangerous criminals, I knew that this memory would be etched into my mind forever. As more police officers arrived and cordoned off the area, they escorted me back home. The officer who had initially interviewed me promised they'd call with any updates on their investigation. I thanked him for his help. I locked my door behind me, my heart finally calming down as I sank into my couch in a daze. While I was grateful to have found help when I did, it was difficult not to think about how close I'd come to facing such senseless violence and cruelty. 
For several nights after that frightening encounter, sleep evaded me. Every time I closed my eyes, images of bloodshot eyes, menacing weapons and taunting smells haunted me. A week later, the officer called to inform me that they had captured both men due to a range of evidence and public tips. As it turned out, the two individuals were part of a criminal gang dabbling in sadistic crimes and targeting innocent people. The streets became safer with each arrest made in their network. Yet despite their capture, I couldn't shake off an overwhelming unease that lurked at the back of my mind a stark reminder of how danger can loom unexpectedly around any corner. And even though time gradually dulled the sharp edges of my memories and nightmares slowly faded, the echoes of that night lived on with those who crossed paths with these inhuman individuals. A chilling reminder of the ordeal we had all faced at the hands of other men. In June 2021, I was making the long drive from Dallas, Texas to Little Rock, Arkansas. My name's Mason Lillard, and I'm a truck driver. Travels are usually uneventful, but this one particular day would forever etch its memory on my mind. I had just said goodbye to Lila, my wife of 15 years, and our two children, Tara and Sam. As much as I hated leaving them for extended periods of time, it was necessary to make ends meet. I decided to take the seemingly endless forested route via Highway 59. It may not have been the fastest path, but it allowed me some much-needed solitude. When I reached the border between Texas and Arkansas, my eyes caught something out of place an old rusted car that clearly hadn't moved in years. It was an odd sight considering how remote this area was. Intrigued by the car's grimy window covered with dust and dirt like a sheet of pale sandpaper, my curiosity got the better of me as I stopped my truck. Something just didn't sit right about this vehicle's presence. Every fiber of my being told me to assess it further. The forest encroaching on either side of the road dwarfed any remaining trace of human life. Or so I thought. I stepped out of my truck and walked tentatively toward the abandoned vehicle. Beside the car lay an old rusty toolbox in the tall grass. A crowbar lay a little distance away. A hostile scene reminiscent of some criminal investigation gone cold. Holy macaroni! I said to myself as I checked it out. It must have been here for ages. Suddenly, about a hundred yards into the trees on the other side of the road, I noticed another unsettling thing, what looked like freshly turned soil that had no reason to be there beyond someone's sinister motives. I couldn't turn a blind eye now. I walked toward the new discovery, desperately trying to stifle my rising fear. Perhaps an accident had occurred, or at least that's what I hoped for as I approached the shallow mound of dirt. Before I got any closer, I heard a noise behind me. My heart skipped a beat as I whipped my head around to see the shadowy form of a man stepping out from behind my truck. He was tall and unusually thin, his body draped in tattered clothing that hung from his frame like curtains on a broken rod. His face was partially hidden by long, stringy hair, and his eyes were two dark, bottomless pits. His presence sent a chill down my spine. I realized quickly that my situation was less than favorable. There was nothing but forest and lonely roads ahead of me which meant no one could have possibly witnessed an uninvited guest bearing down on their victim. My mind scrambled for reasons— Maybe he needed help, but logic dismissed that notion swiftly. As the figure eyed me maliciously, the very air around us turned frigid despite the surrounding trees. What do you want? I shouted out bravely to the shrouded figure, 
despite feeling like my heart would leap from my chest. The figure didn't respond to my question. Instead, he took a slow step closer. I reached for my phone, hoping to call for help, but with shaking hands, I fumbled it, and it fell onto the ground. Frustrated at myself and the situation, I decided that there was no point in trying anymore. This man clearly had an upper hand. Gradually backing away from him, I tried to maintain eye contact to potentially read his intentions. His movements became more aggressive. He charged towards me. Panic rising, I turned to run. But no matter how fast I ran or how much distance I put between us, he remained uncomfortably close behind me. In an attempt to outmaneuver him, I darted to the side and hid behind a tree trunk. Breathing heavily and silently cursing my luck, I waited. The man appeared puzzled by my sudden disappearance, slowing down his pursuit as he searched for me among the thick foliage. Seizing the opportunity, I bolted back towards my truck. However, just as my hand grasped the door handle, he emerged from the tree lean and tackled me to the ground. He began assaulting me relentlessly, his fists like hammers pounding against my body. The pain was excruciating as blood seeped from multiple wounds onto the dirt below us. Summoning every last bit of strength left in my battered body, I pushed him off and scrambled back into my truck with difficulty, barely managing to lock the door before he could grab hold of me again. A guttural growl escaped his throat as rage consumed him even further. This didn't deter him from trying to break through the windows of my truck in an attempt to continue his brutal onslaught. Tears of pain streamed down my face as adrenaline kept me going. In desperation, I located my phone under the dashboard and dialed emergency services. My voice cracked as I hastily relayed what was happening and my location. Seconds felt like hours as I waited for help to arrive. All the while, the man continued bashing on the windows. Finally, sirens pierced the silence, and multiple police vehicles began to appear in the distance. Upon seeing them, fear seemed to build within the attacker's eyes, forcing him to retreat. He disappeared into the dense woodland. The following days saw an extensive manhunt conducted by the police force. Several people had gone missing in the area over the past few weeks, and they suspected that this man was responsible. I remained in a state of shock over the entire incident. A feeling of emptiness accompanied me in every moment. I could not sleep, nor focus on my daily activities. The gruesome sight of that thin, tattered figure hunting me like prey left me with nightmares which I doubted would ever fade away. News broke out a few days later that they had located a makeshift lair deep within those woods. It held chilling reminders of his victims, whose lives he'd mercilessly ended, their remains scattered in various stages of decay. However, despite their best efforts and extensive searches around the region, they were unable to locate or apprehend him. As a result, this terrifying man would continue to loom large on my mind and haunt others who cross his path for years to come. I remember that chilling October in 1995 when I was driving through the dense forests of northern Maine. My name's Harvey Robinson, and I've been a truck driver for over two decades now, hauling loads between isolated towns. You know, there've been times when I'd listen to other drivers' stories while taking a break at the roadside diners and think, that can't possibly be true. But what I experienced that month left me reevaluating my skepticism. It started with a shift that seemed like any other. The job involved collecting lumber from a remote mill. As I hopped into my trusty old Peterbilt, 
I joked with my boss. Hey, Dave, what's the worst that can happen, right? A few ghosts hiding among the pines? He let out a hearty laugh. Either of us realized how things were about to go awry. Halfway through the drive, somewhere between dense trees and foliage, an unusual stench began to penetrate the cabin. At first, it seemed like some revolting roadkill, but as the miles passed by, the smell got worse. Soon, it became nigh unbearable tearing up my eyes and making it difficult to breathe. Approaching the mill in low visibility proved challenging enough without that disturbing odor lingering in the air. I shared my concerns with Joe, a burly guy who'd been working at this mill for years. He brushed it off saying, Oh that? Probably just some hazardous waste from another site nearby. Happens sometimes. As we loaded my truck with lumber under Joe's supervision, Radio chatter among mill workers began to worry me. Someone had stumbled upon an unusual sight earlier. Hundreds of trees had their bark stripped off clean, which was highly unusual for this region. For a moment, we just stood there baffled by the news before quickly resuming our duties. With my truck now loaded, I started my return journey. As I pulled out, Joe casually remarked. Keep a lookout for something odd. We still haven't figured out what's up with those trees, or the stench. Little did I know that I'd soon wish for the familiarity of stripped bark and terrible smells. It was nearly dusk now, and though I tried to shake off the unease, the dark shadows cast by looming trees seemed menacing. The longer I drove, the more uncomfortable I became as if something sinister was approaching. What felt like an eternity later, I noticed flickering headlights barely visible behind me. As they drew closer, the erratic behavior made me question the driver's intentions. Just as panic began to set in, the headlights suddenly vanished, only to reappear within an alarmingly close distance moments later. Despite my best efforts to lose my newfound tail, their persistence grew steadily more aggressive. To make matters worse, I had reached a stretch where the road narrowed to a single lane and was flanked by towering trees on either side. It was at this moment that the car's driver made their move. Instead of attempting to pass me on my left as expected, their vehicle swerved violently off-road and torpedoed through bushes, emerging directly alongside me. As they accelerated further, I caught a glimpse of a man's face through their passenger window. He looked haggard with bloodshot eyes and wild hair, giving off an aura of pure malice. My heart pounding in my chest, I was left with no choice but to slam on the brakes and veer off the main road into a thickly wooded area in an attempt to escape. Barely maneuvering between trees and growing darkness was challenging enough without thinking about what would happen if this angry stranger caught up to me. The unknown attacker's car screeched into view moments later, as he began tearing through vegetation without regard for human life or any other obstacle in his path. Flashes of terror gripped my heart as the realization that this was no longer just a reckless pursuer settled in. This was someone, or something, out for blood. As I navigated the dense woods in a frantic bid to evade my pursuer, my car's tires struggled to find traction on the uneven, muddy terrain. The man behind the wheel of the other car was relentless, his bloodshot eyes fixated on me as he tried to force me off the path. I considered calling for help but quickly realized I had no phone signal in this remote area. Desperate for a way out, I slammed the accelerator and took a sharp turn onto a narrower trail that led deeper into the forest. The unpredictable course threw off my pursuer temporarily, but he continued his pursuit. 
I could hear the crunching of foliage and branches as he drove over them without any hesitation. In an aggravated state, my mind raced as I tried to think of an escape route. Steadily losing daylight, hopelessness settled over me like a suffocating blanket. As the darkness enveloped us both, it became harder to see him barreling towards me. At some point, our luck must have shifted upon reaching a small clearing. The man's car became entangled with tree roots and broken branches that littered the forest floor. He struggled to free himself, frustration oozing from his every furious movement. Slamming on my brakes suddenly gave me just enough distance from him to put a plan into action. Without skipping a beat, I clambered out of my car and scrambled up one of the towering trees nearby. My muscles ached with fear-induced adrenaline as I climbed higher and higher until I felt somewhat safe from immediate danger. From my vantage point among the branches, I could see him trying to free his car then abandoning it when he couldn't make any progress. Now on foot, he scanned back and forth between my car and the surrounding trees with malicious intent. After some time spent stalking my sedan which now seemed like an insignificant speck below us, he appeared to grow frustrated with his fruitless attempts to locate me. He was a tall, gaunt figure with a distinctly unhinged gait. His erratic movements made it harder to reason his next moves. Finally growing weary of the seeming cat-and-mouse game, my relentless pursuer decided it was time for an aggressive approach. He produced a long knife, glinting menacingly in the last rays of twilight, and began hacking at the branches close to my car. My heart pounded furiously in my chest as I prayed for some miracle that would save me from this nightmare. Each swing of his blade seemed more desperate, and unhinged than the last. Suddenly, he struck a weak spot in one of the larger branches and snapped it under the force of his knife. The now unstable tree swayed before slowly crashing down on top of him, pinning him between two massive trunks. The knife fell out of his hand, sinking into the darkness below, leaving him trapped and disarmed. I remained in my hiding place as nightfall descended over the forest completely. Eventually, I noticed faint beams slicing through the thick foliage, headlights from another vehicle approaching from afar. Unsure if this meant help or another threat, I cautiously descended the tree and called out for assistance. A small group of park rangers had been notified by passers-by about disturbances in the forest area and reluctantly came to investigate. They called for backup and managed to restrain and remove my attacker from the scene. They promised that he would be held accountable for his crimes and would no longer pose a danger to anyone. In the end I returned home, bruised, but alive reflecting on those who hadn't been as fortunate in their encounters with similar foes. My gratitude towards my saviors was unreserved but tinged with sadness for what could have easily been my fate had I not been resourceful enough to outsmart my malevolent pursuer. It was February 2010, and I found myself in the dense forests of Oregon, driving my truck to deliver a shipment of construction materials. The job had taken me through remote areas that were virtually abandoned. My name is Vance Sellers, but folks generally call me the Long Hauler. I've always considered myself tough-nosed when it comes to fear but life has a funny way of knocking you down a peg or two. One day stands above the rest, an encounter that no mortal being should ever face. The date was February 25th, if memory serves me right. As I cruised down a winding road surrounded by towering pines and dense foliage around midday, I came across a small stream that had washed away part of the path. 
I decided to get out of my truck to estimate the damage and check if there was any other route I could take. As I hopped out of the cab, my boots sank into the muddy ground and released an unpleasant gas as I walked around. Nothing worth slowing down over, but signs posted nearby suggested waiting for assistance from local rangers. Figuring they'd arrive sooner or later, I decided to stay put for the time being. A few hours passed before I heard a vehicle approaching, yet something was off about the sound rather than an engine's roar. What reached my ears was more like a grinding crunch at each turn of wheels against gravel. When a rusty old pickup truck arrived at my location with caution tape surrounding its boxes and shattered glass in place of headlights, I couldn't help but chuckle at the situation. Looks like we're both having a rough day. I called out to the driver. He stepped out of his truck, and from that moment onward, everything changed. The man before me didn't look human at all. His facial features were twisted and misaligned, his eyes bulbous and bulging from their sockets. His limbs looked unnaturally long and covered in a thick layer of grime. He stared back at me, never speaking a word. Trying to maintain my composure and not let on that I was terrified, I joked. Hey, don't worry. We'll both be out of this mess soon. You know what they say. It's all water under the bridge. But my laughter died in my throat as the driver's body jerked forward in an unsettling manner and began sprinting toward me. Panic surged through me. Instinct told me to run for my life. But instead, I stood there frozen as this thing charged at me with unnatural speed. The creature didn't slow down when it reached me. Instead, it barreled through my body with such force that I was sent crashing to the ground. The air was knocked out of me, and before I knew it, everything went black. When I came to, I found myself hanging upside down suspended from a nearby tree branch. Struggling to free myself from my binds proved impossible. Every time I attempted to move even an inch, unbearable pain shot like fire through my legs where they'd been tied together. That's when the gruesome screams started echoing throughout the surrounding woods, desperate cries for help from others who had fallen victim as well. It was clear now that whatever this being was, it had no intention of simply letting us go. Fear turned into desperation as more and more agonized voices joined the cacophony of pain around me. I realized that if there was any chance of survival or escape, it needed to happen immediately. With renewed determination and adrenaline pumping through my veins, I tried once more to break free from my bindings. As the agonized screams around me continued, I tried to come up with a plan that would allow me to escape. My legs were tied together, so I could not use them to help myself break free. I glanced upwards at the branch suspending me in the air, and an idea struck me. If I could somehow swing my body towards the tree trunk, perhaps I would find something to brace my hands against and use my weight to tug myself free. Grunting from effort and pain, I slowly started to sway back and forth, building momentum. The pain was intense, but the sounds of suffering from others pushed me to continue. With each swing, I moved closer to the tree trunk. On finally reaching it, panting heavily, I managed to grab onto a protruding branch. Using all my remaining strength, I put my weight into pulling myself free. The rope finally snapped, and I fell onto the forest floor with a thud. Ignoring the discomfort of landing on hard ground, there was no time to waste as I grabbed a sharp rock and began cutting through the binds around my legs. Once free, I took in my surroundings and searched for any sign of help in sight. Unsure where I was or if any familiar landmarks were around me, I limped through the woods looking for other survivors or a potential way out of this nightmare. Then, through the trees ahead of me, 
I spotted a group of people. As I approached cautiously, unsure if they were captured or working with this twisted villain who had tormented us all, what I found was a mixture of both. Some were clearly suffering like myself while others stood imposingly over them. Noticing that those imposing figures seemed distracted by their phones or twisted pleasure in torturing their victims gave feeling my only chance at escape would be through confrontation. Though there was consensus among arguing captors that they were waiting for their leader the very man who had captured and strung me up to return before getting rid of the rest of us, I recalled the stranger's warning. The villain does not participate in any conversation. Taking advantage of a momentary lapse in their attention, I whispered to the other victims for a plan as time remains tight. The moment our captor returns, we need to strike together to incapacitate who we can, aiding our escape. Those scared and weak, they agreed that this impending chance may be a life-changing opportunity. As predicted from their arguing, our captor arrived, disheveled and scanning the faces of his prisoners. At that moment, we put our plan into action surging toward whoever stood over us or was only distracted by their devices. The attackers were caught entirely off guard, some entrapped before toppling against others in the ensuing chaos. With luck on our side, we made hasty progress in executing our escape. The last thing I saw as we fled from that nightmare scene was the expression of disbelief and rage on the face of the monstrous man who had tormented us all. It was an image burned into my memory, but one that I would never forget. We escaped into the forest together, limping, battered and damaged by what we had endured. Despite sorting whether we recognized one another from a certain area or if someone knew how to contact authorities for help without putting us at risk again, there remained silent acknowledgement. You don't ask any question, but at least freedom was in sight before long. Emerging from encroaching darkness surrounding woodlands into safety under police protection beams of flashing blue and red lights were a relief our traumatic experience finally behind us. Over time healing both physically and mentally came slowly yet surely for survivors amidst ongoing criminal investigations backslash. If anything is true following such experiences, it is vital to cherish moments spent with loved ones as life could easily turn very dark. Last August, I picked up a new gig where my sole purpose was to haul cargo from point A to point B across the remote United States. Just me and my trusty rig, Big Bertha. Most days were monotonous, but that all changed one bleak night when an unforeseen occurrence made my truck driving days much darker than I'd ever imagined. My name is Clyde Sanders and I've been a truck driver most of my adult life. Throughout my career, my favorite routes always involved driving through unexplored, isolated stretches of America's vast landscape. I recall that foggy evening vividly. The delivery was time-sensitive, so I had no time to rest or dally in any scenic truck stops along the semi-lush landscape. Usually, I tried to make a connection with fellow drivers over the CB radio for company during the long drives. But on this particular night, despite multiple attempts at chatter, no response came back through the static. Feeling increasingly isolated as the dark night swallowed the deserted road in front of me, all I could hear was the sound of Big Bertha's engine droning on mercilessly. The mysterious hitchhiker appeared seemingly out of nowhere on a narrow road cutting through Janesville Forest, Wisconsin. They were standing by a broken-down car on the side of the road gesturing urgently for help with shallow desperation, while clothed in a torn gray sweater. The man's features barely discernible, 
unkempt hair and bloodshot eyes screamed silently for rescue. A strange intuition sank deep in my gut. Something wasn't right. No harm in stopping, I told myself hesitantly, ignoring my intuition. Duty calls. As I climbed out of Big Bertha and cautiously approached him under the ominous moonlight, his deadened eyes stared directly into mine as if piercing into my soul. I need help. He croaked hoarsely without sharing any further information. A chill snaked down my spine, accompanied by an inexplicable dread. What was throwing me off? It took mere seconds for me to realize that this man wasn't breathing, at least not like a regular human being. His chest barely moved, and there was a distant smell of rot wafting from his direction like metal and turned meat mingling within the fresh expanse around us. Feeling apprehensive, I nodded mechanically while swallowing hard. Sure, let me just grab my toolbox, I stammered, feeling suddenly very far away from Big Bertha's warm cab that now seemed eons away, its metallic armor shirking behind dense fog and darkened trees. As I fumbled for my tools which seemed damp and clammy in the encroaching cold of the night, the eerie macabre sensation of being scrutinized emanated from the mysterious stranger. His eyes never strayed from me as they glinted ominously like crimson daggers in the dark casting sinister shapes across his hollowed cheeks and jutting collarbones. In an attempt to lighten the atmosphere juxtaposing such grim circumstances cloaked in uncertainty, I tried to crack a joke. You know what they say. Laughter is the best medicine. Except when you've got diarrhea. To my dismay, his face remained stoic even though one corner of his cracked lips twitched upward unnervingly for a split second before fading away into obscurity. As I bent over his car hood while keeping one eye on him, my fingers slippery as they darted through a myriad of tools, wires, and screws, I pondered if I could make it back safely to Big Bertha without pissing off some unknown entity whose intentions are still shrouded in shadows of enigma. Suddenly and without warning, the stranger closed in with nefarious intent pooling within his soulless eyes. His twisted visage contorted into a gruesome incarnation of malice sickening enough to etch within an onlooker's nightmares. His flesh, covered in festering sores and deep gashes reminiscent of battles waged against monumental forces and gravity-defying elements, rippled like oceans churning towards an apocalyptic storm. The stranger lunged at me his gnarled hands grasping my throat as we both toppled to the ground. Panic radiated through me, and I struggled against his vice-like grip. As this unknown assailant tightened his hold on my neck, I glanced to the side, desperately searching for any available means to defend myself or a way to escape. My eyes fell upon a heavy wrench I had brought with me from Big Bertha, Mustering all the strength left in me, I reached out and managed to wrap my fingers around the cold metal. With every ounce of desperation, I swung the wrench toward the side of the stranger's head. Connecting with a sickening crunch, he fell limp on top of me. Shaking with fear and adrenaline, I pushed his lifeless body off of me and scrambled to my feet. My breaths came in short gasps, as I looked down at him lying motionless on the asphalt. I couldn't leave him like this. Even if he attacked me first, it wasn't clear why he did it or what lasting effects of my blow. I reached for my cell phone in my pocket to call for help but realized reception was weak in this area. The thought of having to journey back to Big Bertha loomed ominously over me as any hopes of getting help seemed to vanish into obscurity. A faint tapping sound just beyond our location caught my attention. Peering through the darkness into the dense forest that surrounded us revealed a man emerging from the woods. Hey! He called out to me, 
his voice heavy with concern. I heard a commotion out here. Are you all right? As he approached us, I could see he was an older gentleman, maybe someone who lived close by and had heard our struggle. It's not what it looks like. I stammered as I tried explaining what happened between me and the stranger. His eyes widened as he surveyed the scene before us. I believe you, son. Let's get you out of here, he stated with authority, quickly helping me gather my scattered tools. He offered to take me back to Big Bertha in his truck. Both relief and suspicion washed over me though I had little choice but to accept his offer. As we drove in silence, the old man sighed deeply and spoke up. You're lucky you managed to fend him off. What do you mean? Who was that guy? I asked cautiously, suddenly curious about the stranger who tried to attack me. We don't know much about him, the old man replied hesitantly. He's been around these parts for a while now, showing up only every once in a while. Probably some drifter who's gone off the deep end. The weight of what had just happened began to sink in as I realized how close I had come to losing my life that night. For a moment, I considered opening up about my feelings but decided against it. As we reached Big Bertha and made our goodbyes, the old man expressed his concern for my well-being and hoped that I would recover from the traumatizing encounter. The ordeal had shaken me more than I could express at that moment. Later on, sleeping comfortably in Big Bertha's cab seemed nothing less than a miracle as I struggled to sort out my whirlwind of thoughts and emotions about the past hour's events. The eerie encounter with the deranged stranger and his gruesome features eerily etched into my memory should have left me with nightmares for days. But what lingered most was humbling appreciation for the older gentleman's timely intervention and genuine concern for a stranger like me amid such distress, an act of selflessness that showcased humanity's resilient capacity for compassion even under dire circumstances. And so it was, with renewed determination, gratitude, and ironically, a shred of curiosity, I sped off to my next destination, promising myself that I would never take life's unnerving detours for granted again. That day in November 2015, I was just an ordinary truck driver. My name's Kenton, by the way. Trucking had been my routine for years, traveling from state to state with my buddy Vince. We had started working together and quickly became friends, making the long drives more bearable and those endless miles a little less lonely. Vince and I were making our merriment as we cruised along that remote highway somewhere in Colorado's dense forest region. It seemed like just another unremarkable trip, although either of us could ignore our growling stomachs or crave for caffeine. As luck would have it, we soon came across what appeared to be a makeshift diner nestled between shoots of trembling aspen trees. Reckoning it to be an ideal pit stop, we parked our trucks and strolled inside. Wow! Vince joked, looking around at the rustic decor. I hope their food is better than this lousy joint appears. I laughed it off. But one can't underestimate a good meal in the middle of nowhere. We approached the rickety counter with anticipation, where a woman with wild frizzy hair greeted us. We'd been warned about pausing in rural spots, but isolation had left us keen for interaction. Her name was Margie Ogden, engraved on her tarnished name tag. The chit-chat we struck up came effortlessly. It was almost as if she'd known us forever. Kenton! Vince! You boys take a seat there in the corner booth, she declared with authority. 
She served us some mundane coffee and stale donuts that we gratefully gobbled down while our food sizzled away in the kitchen, a sumptuous feast that made up for those absent comforts we'd become accustomed to. It wasn't long after eating that Margie began sharing stories of strange occurrences in those parts, tales that ignited the secrecy of small-town secrets. In particular, she recounted a recent tale about a man terrorizing the area. She claimed he was responsible for several murders, did his vicious deeds without motive and was rarely seen by anyone who lived to tell about it. Margie explained that the killer only existed as a shadow, undeniably violent, evading capture with surprising skill. She claimed she'd had a run-in with him once before but couldn't describe his exact features, only a horrifying sense of malevolence. Vince and I couldn't help but exchange uneasy glances. Finished with our plates now, heavy with food and stories, we paid our bill and ambled back to our trucks, anxiety hanging thick in the air. We carried on that day toward our destination a desolate cabin off the beaten track. As dusk drew in, we thought less about that ghastly tale from which we'd come. But when darkness finally descended, the vulnerability was palpable. Eventually, we stopped to rest for the remaining night at an isolated spot near a lake off the highway. It was then that things changed for us drastically. The gravel crunching underfoot echoed through the forest as we built our campfire in silence at the water's edge. Suddenly, I heard rustling somewhere in those woods behind us where no footprints should have been. As I turned my head toward those sounds unnerving in their unexpectedness, my heart pounded with that chilling memory of the unnamed killer from Margie's story. Hey Vince, I whispered after he too had stopped abruptly to listen. You think somebody else is out there? He just shrugged nervously. Our eyes scanned those darkened trees until they met the figure emerging from within them. He walked tall and deliberate toward our trembling forms, this indistinct man who appeared more like an expression than any embodiment of humanity. We stared back in odd paralysis as he nonchalantly approached our campfire, gripping with fingers smeared in blood tight upon his weapon of choice, a crimson-stained axe, glistening as if set ablaze by our firelight. Having nowhere to run and nothing to lose in that pregnant moment, terrified whispers shot through the air. Vince! He's coming for us! What do we do? In an instant, I found myself acting on instinct. Vince, grab a branch! We need to defend ourselves, I urged, our survival instincts kicking in. Vince nodded and quickly picked up a thick branch lying nearby. We knew we couldn't outrun the menacing figure with the axe, so we decided it would be better to try and find a way to overpower him. The axe-wielding man continued his steady approach, each step exuding confidence and malevolence. As he neared our trembling forms, he paid no attention to the makeshift weapons we gripped in our hands, his eyes locked on our own like a predator hungrily eyeing its prey. Despite the fear coursing through my veins, I took a deep breath and thought about our situation rationally. Neither Vince nor I had seen this man before. Perhaps he was simply a deranged individual feeding off our panic. But regardless of his motivations, it was clear we had no choice but to defend ourselves if we wanted any chance of surviving. As Vince and I prepared for a confrontation against this man and with murderous intent, I realized that neither of us had called for help, a glaring oversight. Grabbing my phone from my pocket, I dialed 911 as quickly as my shaking fingers would allow me to. The line connected and I frantically described our predicament to the operator on the other end. Meanwhile, Vince took several steps toward the man with unwavering determination etched on his face while gripping his makeshift weapon. However, 
Instead of reacting with aggression or fear at our attempts to fend him off, the man simply tilted his head with a wicked grin stretching across his mangled face. A terrifying sight that only amplified our fears. The air thickened as the man raised his axe high in preparation for an attack, and panic set in once again. But something else caught my attention just then. In the distance behind our attacker, the flashing lights of police sirens whipped through the trees, rapidly approaching. Seeing the man momentarily distracted by the approaching sirens, I saw an opportunity. I charged at him, ramming my shoulder into his chest and knocking him off balance. Vince followed suit, striking him with the branch he held tightly in both hands. As if on cue, several police officers emerged from the shadows armed with guns drawn and aimed at our fallen assailant. The officers quickly apprehended him, where he lay bloodied and incapacitated. We realized our plan had worked. His terror-filled reign had finally met its end. The exhausting mix of relief and pure adrenaline brought us to our knees as we watched the police escort the axe-wielding lunatic away. It was over in a matter of moments. Our camping trip transformed from a simple getaway into a haunting memory that would stay with us forever. Wordlessly, without even discussing it, we made a silent pact never to return to this lakeside haven turn nightmare. In the following days, Vince and I would learn that not everyone had been as fortunate as us during this man-man's vengeful spree. Some had paid for it with their lives. Neither of us could ever forget those horrifying events or the innocent lives lost as a result. It was these victims whose bravery we remembered whenever gratitude for our lives filled our hearts and minds. Each night was a reminder of just how precious life can be, and how easily it might be taken away in an unexpected instant. As time moved forward, Vince and I found our way back to a semblance of normalcy. And yet there were times when we'd close our eyes and find ourselves standing beside that campfire near the lake once more, next prickling with fear as we encountered that faceless figure all over again. Life had taught us a valuable lesson. Sometimes things aren't quite as they seem, and that reality can often be the most chilling nightmare of all. It was February 1994 when this whole ordeal started. I deemed Michelson a truck driver of six years, found myself going through a grueling stretch of Highway 50 in Colorado. This particular haul was quite tricky due to the narrow winding roads, and I was extra focused on driving safely. During my break at a gas station diner, I cracked a stupid joke to the waitress to ease my nerves. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. She laughed probably more out of politeness than anything. Just as I finished my black coffee, I caught sight of my boss entering the diner, red-faced and frantic. He informed me that one of our other drivers had been injured in an ambush. An extreme group targeting cross-country truckers had blockaded the road and pelted rocks at their windshield. I couldn't believe it as he listed out the injuries. Broken arm fractured skull, and countless bruises all over her body. The description left me unsettled as I realized the area I was about to drive through could hold these dangerous people. Embarking on my journey once again felt like an eternity, but there were no signs of any unusual activity during the initial hour back on the road. Dusk slowly crept in like an unwanted presence while I cautiously continued driving. As daylight faded into darkness, it seemed as though misfortune had finally caught up with me. My truck's headlight illuminated a foot-long chain strewn across the road ahead. Just as I decided to slam on the brakes, avoiding potential disaster, 
a large figure emerged from behind dense trees by roadside. The ominous figure approached my tractor trailer quickly with impossible strides. He appeared to be about six feet five inches with shaggy chestnut hair and dirty-looking skin resembling worn-out leather shoes. His clothes were scruffy and matched his wild appearance perfectly a torn flannel shirt with a faded camouflage vest. The most menacing part of his appearance was his black leather gloves, holding something shiny and sharp as if it was the perfect extension of his hand. Fear drove me to grab my cell phone for help, but the poor signal in the area made calling 911 a futile attempt. My heart raced as my luck grew dimmer by the second, and so did my chances of survival. As he came closer, I could make out minute details on his face. The insane glint in his eyes terrified me beyond belief, and I knew at that moment that asking him for help was out of the question. Our eyes met for a brief second as he continued toward me. I trembled inside my cabin, considering my options. Should I honk my truck's horn repeatedly, hoping it would scare him away or alert someone close by? On the other hand, it might provoke him into acting out more violently, an unthinkable consequence. Fully aware that I had limited options, I decided to confront him verbally while keeping a physical distance. My voice quivered as I pressed down on the PA button and shouted, Stop right there! What do you want from me? To my astonishment, he let out an ominous chuckle raising his weapon even higher to unveil what appeared to be a vicious-looking machete. There was no sense of humor or empathy hidden behind that soulless laugh. I decided to risk turning on the engine and reversing the truck, hoping to create distance between us. As the engine roared to life, the figure halted momentarily, slightly taken aback. I slammed my foot on the accelerator, but the gigantic figure became more enraged than deterred. He sprinted towards my vehicle with terrifying speed and ruthlessness. With every ounce of strength, I pushed harder on the pedal and swerved left and right, desperately trying to shake him off. It wasn't long before he reached my truck and swung his machete with blinding violence at anything within its deadly arc. The first hit severed my air horn clean from its mountings. The second strike shattered my side mirror, raining shards of glass over me. I continued to floor it in reverse, praying for a miracle or some form of divine intervention. As if on cue, an approaching semi-truck's headlights broke through the darkness behind me. Hearing the familiar thrum of another tractor trailer could mean salvation or doom. It was now down to a matter of luck. The insane man momentarily released his grip on my truck and glanced towards the incoming vehicle. Just enough time for me to commit to a desperate plan. Swinging my steering wheel sharply, I spun the vehicle around in a tight circle, nearly overturning myself in the process. My move took the deranged attacker by surprise. In that instant, he was caught off balance as he struggled to predict where I would go next. Then came an earth-shattering crash as the approaching semi-truck collided with him at full speed. Tangled metal and deafening screeches filled the air as the psycho's body was intertwined with twisted wreckage from both our tractor trailers. The smell of burning rubber accompanied by plumes of smoke invaded my nostrils. I unbuckled myself from my seat and rushed over to check on the other driver in an adrenaline-fueled frenzy. I found him lying amidst the wreckage, unconscious but miraculously alive. Immediately, I called 911 once again. This time, I was able to make contact. After what seemed like forever... The sound of sirens and flashing lights in the distance indicated that emergency responders were on their way. Upon arriving at the scene, 
Police officers and paramedics examined both drivers and me. The other driver suffered from multiple contusions and a broken arm, while I experienced minor cuts and bruises. The police took our statements and informed us that they would investigate the gruesome scene to learn more about the horrific events of this night. As I was being ushered into a waiting ambulance for further examination, my eyes shifted back to where the demented man laid lifeless amongst the debris. His story would probably never be uncovered, only spoken of in hushed tones by those who witnessed his final moments on this earth. The police later identified my assailant and discovered he had a dark criminal past linked to several unresolved abduction cases in the area. Knowing that I had inadvertently put an end to his reign of terror provided no comfort. Instead, it haunted me endlessly. To pay respects to those who we lost to this madman's cruelty, our small town held a memorial service celebrating their lives cut short. I never drove along that stretch of highway again, unable to bear the memories contained within it. Though my actions saved another driver's life that night, my own existence had been scarred by an overpowering sense of vulnerability and anxiousness. And so it was that fate, with its unpredictable twists and turns, intervened only to leave me painfully aware that danger could lurk within even the most mundane moments of everyday life. My name is Jonah Goodman, and I'll always remember the month of October, 2015. At the time, I worked as a truck driver, hauling cargo across the remote areas of the United States. It was tough work that took me far from home, but it helped me forge a series of experiences that have come to shape my life in ways I could never have imagined. My story starts on one of those cold autumn mornings in a small rest stop near Klamath National Forest in California. As I sipped on my morning coffee, I noticed that the chatter from fellow truck drivers was slightly elevated this morning. They were discussing an incident along one of the routes. Apparently, several truckers had encountered an unusually aggressive individual causing disturbances in a rest area further down the road. This person was described as tall and muscular with disheveled hair and a piercing gaze, certainly someone who should be avoided. By noon, I'd completely forgotten about those earlier conversations and proceeded on to my route as usual. Hours passed as I made my way deep into the forested roads of Northern California when suddenly my CB radio crackled to life startling me. It was another driver talking about an incident that seemed eerily similar to what I'd heard this morning. Apparently, someone discovered human remains scattered within the trees around a rest stop that matched the description of the previous occurrences. This revelation shook me up but did not deter me. After all, I had to deliver my cargo or risk my job. These incidents seemed so surreal. Could they possibly be linked to that strange man everyone described? Later that evening, while at another secluded rest stop off Route 199, tragedy would strike close to home. As night fell like a black cloak enveloping an unsuspecting prey, Rain lashed against my windshield while gusts of wind howled all around me like morning ghosts. Anxiety gripped me as darkness encroached, but I knew I had to push on for one more stop during this long haul. Suddenly, my truck's engine sputtered and began to falter. Seeing the dashboard lights fickle, I surmised that I'd been experiencing electrical issues. I reluctantly pulled over to the side of the road, cursing my misfortune. The wind was less violent here, though the rain hammered against my truck as the surrounding forest formed a shroud of shadows. I grabbed my toolbox and braced myself before stepping out into the torrential downpour. As I pried open the hood and leaned over the engine, 
a sense of unease washed over me. It felt as if someone was lurking in the darkness beyond the reach of my truck's dim headlights. Suddenly, there was a soft snap behind me, like twigs breaking under a heavy weight. My heart raced as I swung around and made out an immense figure emerging from behind a tree nearby. The tall, disheveled man towered over me with wild hair and eyes that seemed void of humanity. He began advancing steadily and deliberately towards me with effortless grace despite his intimidating stature. Panic engulfed my mind as I scrambled back into my cab, grabbed the radio and stammered into it, trying to reach any other driver who could hear me. Out of breath and fumbling with fear in every word, I described my plight valiantly, pleading for aid. My radio burst alive. A driver heard my plea. He quickly dispatched help but urged caution against engaging with that bizarre individual alone. As I struggled to plot an escape strategy in those dire moments, all control slipped away from reason when chilling entwinements enveloped me without mercy. Formidable hands had embraced their prey relentlessly leaving no chance for escape. The realization descended upon me like rolling thunder, the fearsome specter spoken about by others now stood before me with grim intent only known to him. His grip grew tighter, stifling my screams. The truck's headlights became paler yet as my world slowly faded and my struggle dwindled. I tried to muster my strength and make a loud noise in hopes that someone, anyone nearby would sense my distress. The faint sound that escaped me was barely audible over the persistent rain. The towering man tightened his grip further, rendering me weak and helpless. As the situation became more dire, I spotted headlights approaching in the distance. My eyes widened in hope and desperation as the source of light grew closer. The beams of light illuminated the scene making it clear to whoever was arriving that I was in an unfathomable danger. The man's expression shifted from cruel confidence to uncertainty, as he realized that help was coming. His grip loosened, giving me just enough room to gather my strength and free myself from his clutches, his nails tearing through my skin as I wriggled free. I scrambled towards the approaching vehicle, not daring to look back at the sinister figure left behind. As I reached safety behind the car door, I found myself greeted by a middle-aged woman with furrowed eyebrows and a concerned expression. Are you all right? She asked urgently, her voice shaking slightly from adrenaline. I, I think so. I managed to choke out between ragged breaths. There's a man. He attacked me. Spotting the approaching headlights had been a stroke of luck. The driver who had heard my plea over the radio must have sent help or alerted others to be on guard for others on this desolate road. As we pulled away from my broken-down truck, I saw in the rearview mirror that the menacing figure had disappeared into the shadows. The days following proved challenging as police conducted their investigation into the incident. They assured me they were doing everything possible to locate and apprehend the man responsible for my harrowing encounter. Yet despite their assurances, every passing day felt like an eternity as fear continued to seize me. During this time of despair, another truck driver informed of several similar incidents along the same stretch of road detailing how others had also been terrorized and attacked by a colossal man with wild hair and dead eyes. Authorities had not yet linked these cases or found enough evidence to prove that these incidents were perpetrated by the same individual. Nevertheless, the trucking community remained wary and on high alert for any signs of this dangerous stranger. Finally, after several days, the police revealed they had located a suspect who matched the description provided by numerous truckers and me. He was an individual with a history of violence, and was found residing deep within the forest where he had isolated himself for years. 
The man faced multiple counts of assault, kidnapping, and torture. The relief that washed over me at this news was immeasurable. I knew nothing could erase the memory or the pain from the terrifying attack I experienced, but at least knowing that he'd been caught comforted me. As time moved on, my wounds slowly began to heal. However, I held on to those haunting glimpses into the depths of human depravity. In honoring those who had suffered in his hands or were taken from us too soon, I vowed never to let fear dominate my life. The trucking community continued to be vigilant whenever we traveled through that dark forest road. We provided support to one another in our shared determination to ensure no one else would fall victim to such malicious attacks again. In an oddly bittersweet way, this traumatic event brought us closer together. It helped us understand the importance of being proactive when faced with adversity and remaining strong enough to seek help when needed. I blinked at my reflection in the side mirror of my semi-truck. It was March 2013, and I, Eric Caldwell, was parked at a remote gas station somewhere in northern Idaho, getting ready for another long day of driving. I glanced over to the flimsy map pinned to the wall and sighed. My next stop was just over 50 miles away, deep in a rather isolated forest area. Cracking open the truck door, I hopped back into the driver's seat and turned on the radio. Today's special, enjoy some classic hits while you drive, announced the DJ through fading static. As I cruised down the narrow road leading towards my destination, trees on either side swallowed me in their shadows. There wasn't much reason to be concerned, but I couldn't shake off the growing sensation of feeling watched. Suddenly, a figure stepped onto the road in front of me as if from nowhere. I jolted forward with my left foot smashing onto the brake pedal, narrowly avoiding collision. My heart raced violently as adrenaline courses through my veins as I stared at the figure before me. It appeared to be a man, tall and lanky with an odd gait, making him seem like he was floating rather than walking. He wore worn denim overalls stained with something brownish red on his chest and legs. His face partially obscured by shaggy hair, but what little I could see was twisted into an unnatural grin that revealed more teeth than any human ought to have. You need a hand there, Eric? He rasped, not moving from his spot on the road. I couldn't comprehend how he knew my name. But considering we were miles away from civilization, this was strange enough for me not to ask questions. No thanks, I called out nervously, attempting to bring levity into a tense situation. Norman Bates already gave me directions. The bizarre man laughs, his guffaw more unnerving than anything I had ever heard. It was a sound that would haunt my memories forever. I revved the engine and tried to steer around the figure, but in a heartbeat, he was above me on top of the cab of my truck with a swift, almost inhuman leap. Thud after thud echoed through the interior as he seemed to search for a way inside. Dread coiled like a thick fog in the air, leaving me grappling with what to do next. There wasn't any cell phone reception in this area. I'd already tried earlier. Moreover, stopping at a remote gas station in northern Idaho had thrown every instinct screaming caution to the wind. I dared to peek from under my hands, and saw the twisted creature leaping off my truck and back onto the road. I seized that opportunity to put the pedal to the metal and sped off into oblivion. Tracking my path through the rearview mirror, I watched as he sprinted after me on all fours with unbelievable speed. Panic striking, I shouted out loud, What do you want from me? With every mile traveled further into its territory, 
it only seemed to grow angrier and more determined, trying everything in its power to get into my truck cabin or force me off the road. I recollected rumors of isolated attacks against truck drivers circulating in nearby towns. Could this be some sick vigilante attempting to assert control over their territory? Or something far more twisted? I did everything possible to escape this creature that pursued me relentlessly, swerving between trees and turning up hillsides. But nothing seemed to slow it down. Continuing our deadly dance deep within that forested terrain, I came upon another vehicle parked on the side, doors flung open and abandoned with no sign of its driver or passengers. Struggling between continuing onward or investigating further, I spotted the demented figure slinking closer in the rearview mirror. In that decisive moment, I chose to keep driving. I slammed the brakes as I noticed another car up ahead, abandoned on the side of the road. The eerie figure was still relentlessly chasing me. There was no time to lose, so I grabbed my CB radio and urgently called for help. Breaker, breaker! Anyone out there? I need urgent assistance on Highway 41 near Thompson's Pass. As I swerved the truck around the other car, a distant crackle came in response before finally, someone responded. I'm close by. What's wrong? Over, a voice said. I'm being chased by someone or something vicious. I quickly replied. Stay on the line and keep driving towards Thompson's Pass. There's a police outpost up ahead. Hopefully they can stop this man man before he gets to you, the voice said. With every fiber of my being focused on reaching that outpost and feeling grateful for obtaining some sort of help, I kept driving as fast as I could while avoiding any possible obstacles in my way. The attacker appeared relentless and grew more unhinged with each passing second. His face was a mangled mess of rage, contorted with an unyielding fervor that sent chills down my spine. He had long, unkempt hair and his clothes were torn and disheveled as if he hadn't changed them in ages. As I neared the police outpost, I saw multiple squad cars parked outside with their lights on, their presence offering me a glimmer of hope. But to my horror, the sinister figure caught up to me right before reaching safety. He lunged at my door window, smashing it to pieces with his bare hands. Despite cuts on his knuckles from the broken glass, he seemed unfazed as blood mixed with shards that fell around him. While struggling to stay on course towards the outpost at top speed amidst shattered glass flying around me, one thought played repeatedly in my mind, no matter what, I must reach that outpost. As I closed in on the outpost, I desperately prayed for the quick interjection of law enforcement to save me from this lunatic. I mustered a final burst of energy and weaved through the entrance, while the malicious figure roared with fury. Officers poured out from inside, armed and ready to confront this madman. I opened my door, carefully stepping out as blood dripped where the window once was. The police aimed their weapons towards the attacker who charged at them fearlessly. A terrifying scream echoed throughout the night as shouts rang out, stopping the maniac in his tracks. He lay motionless on the ground, his lifeless gaze fixated on me. As I sat on an ambulance stretcher and watched officers zip up a body bag containing my tormentor, I couldn't help but remember the other abandoned vehicle not too far back down that road and hope that whoever those people were, they found safety from this horrifying experience as well. Following that nightmarish ordeal, I returned to my truck route but never again stopped at any remote locales. My trucking life continued, albeit with a newfound wariness fueled by lingering memories of that night's terror.
a fear that lives within me each time I glimpse into my rearview mirror wondering if another sadistic monster might one day hunt me down again. September 2003 I had been driving my truck for three years without any major incidents. Just a balding, hard-working guy named Max earning his income behind the wheel and hauling goods for a living. My days usually consisted of highway stretches, highway diners, and roadside rest areas. Nothing fancy or adventurous. That particular evening, as I drove around the remote edges of Pennsylvania along with my wife, Sylvia, who often joined me on trips, we passed through a small forgotten township. An unsettling sight soon caught our attention. Two trucks abandoned at odd angles along the road with shattered glass from their respective windshields and windows. The uneasy feeling that settled in my chest reminded me of that time when some guys duped me out of a hundred bucks back in high school. Should we call someone? Sylvia asked with obvious concern. I hesitated for a moment before answering. We're miles away from the nearest town and haven't seen another soul since we left. It'll be quicker if we drive to report it. As we continued down the winding road, we couldn't help but notice that something peculiar was happening in this area. The further we drove, the more abandoned cars appeared scattered by the roadside as if they had suffered simultaneous breakdowns. A shuffling sound interrupted our tense discussion about what might have happened to all these abandoned vehicles. I immediately pulled over at the nearest clearing to investigate. My heart pounded hard as Sylvia handed me a flashlight. Do you need help? She asked nervously. No, stay in the truck, I replied gruffly. I stepped outside only to discover an oil trail on the ground leading into the forest. It seemed like every hair on my arms stood up simultaneously as I followed it deeper into the trees. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon a gruesome scene. A terrified man was bound to a tree with barbed wire, skin sliced open everywhere and bleeding profusely, eyes bulging with fear, and above all, he was still alive. I heard his muffled pleas for help punctuated by ragged breathing through the thick duct tape seal on his mouth. As I cautiously approached him to offer assistance, my flashlight flickered off without warning. Suddenly, a deafening gunshot rang out across the woods, causing me to instinctively drop to the ground. Panicking slightly for Sylvia's safety now that she was alone in the truck, I doubled back as fast as I could. My heart sank as I emerged from the thick brush to see our truck with its windows smashed and Sylvia gone. Sylvia! I shouted desperately. My voice echoed through the trees as if to mock my despair. A low chuckle sounded from somewhere close by, a voice that seemed uncomfortably familiar, accompanied by heavy footsteps crunching against the dry foliage closer and closer. The flashlight in my hand now glowed dimly, offering little comfort or reassurance as terror washed over me. Desperate to save myself and find Sylvia, I plucked up the little courage left within me and shone it in the direction of that sinister laugh. What I saw made my blood run cold. A scar-covered man with sharpened teeth and unnervingly fast reflexes darted between tree branches wielding a gun in one hand and a bloody knife in the other. Fearing for my life, I decided to call for help. I fumbled in my pocket and found my phone quickly dialing 911 as the man with the scarred face continued to approach me. As I tried to explain the dire situation to the operator, a sharp, searing pain shot through my leg, forcing me to drop to the ground. The man had shot me from afar, knowing he had me at his mercy. Don't move, he snarled, now only a few feet away. I remained motionless on the ground, 
my eyes locked onto his twisted grin. From a nearby tree, I could hear Sylvia whimpering. She was hanging upside down, hogtied with ropes digging into her wrists and ankles. Her eyes were wide and filled with unfathomable terror. Just as the scar-faced man raised his gun towards Sylvia, the faint sound of sirens erupted in the distance. The man stopped abruptly and looked around cautiously. What's your game here? I asked in desperation as sweat dripped down my forehead. Ignoring me, the man swiftly cut Sylvia down from her bindings and shoved her dagger-like knife against her throat. I don't have time for this, he growled. You're coming with me. Police cars came tearing through the forest, screeching to a halt a short distance away from us. Officers with drawn guns emerged from their vehicles and shouted commands at the scar-faced assailant. Drop your weapon and let her go! One stepped forward cautiously while keeping his firearm trained on the attacker. The man hesitated but ultimately relented, dropping both his gun and knife while pushing Sylvia away from him violently. She tumbled towards me without resisting, pure shock leaving her helpless. I didn't hesitate. I grabbed her arm and pulled us both behind some underbrush, just enough cover to seem like we were no longer targets or hostages. The officers subdued the scar-faced man without further violence cuffing him and leading him back to their vehicles as paramedics tended to our injuries. It wasn't long before Sylvia and I were being wheeled on gurneys towards an ambulance. As we lay in our hospital beds recovering from one of the most terrifying experiences of our lives, detectives provided chilling details regarding the man who attacked us. He was a ruthless sociopath with a history of violent crimes torturing and killing his victims with unforeseeable malice. The images and nightmares from that awful night haunted us for days following. But as time passed, the raw pain we experienced slowly dulled, lessening like a receding tide. While the wounds of the body eventually began to heal, albeit it sluggishly, the deep-rooted fear remained within us like dreaded echoes forever etched into our memories. Sylvia and I would never forget those chilling events, nor would the community at large. As days turned into weeks after our trauma had subsided somewhat, memorials erected scattered heavily throughout the area observing individuals whose fates were not as fortunate as ours, in remembrance of the lives lost to a soulless man-man. We looked to each other for support during this harrowing time in our lives ever grateful for our survival yet mournful for those who didn't make it out alive. One ordinary June 1994, I was driving my truck through a remote area of Minnesota, heading towards a delivery near the border of Iowa. My name's Derek Malloy, and trucking is my livelihood. It was a particularly long haul that evening, and I was doing my best to stay focused by listening to my favorite rock and roll station on the radio. As I traveled along the seemingly endless forested road, I noticed something peculiar on the side of the road up ahead. It was hard to see clearly in the dim evening light but it appeared to be a car wreckage that must have occurred recently. Bits of shattered glass and twisted metal glittered amongst the lush greenery. As I pulled over and switched on my high beams to get a better look at the scene, I clicked on my CB radio and called out for help, but there was only static in response. With no cell phone reception out in these remote parts, it seemed like I'd have to handle whatever situation lay ahead alone for now. Stepping out of my truck cautiously, I approached the wreckage, feeling an unnerving chill as goosebumps prickled across my skin. The car appeared to have veered off the road rather violently. But who would abandon this mangled mess? 
there weren't any signs of people around. Suddenly, from a dense thicket nearby, a man emerged carrying what looked like car parts. Relieved to see someone who could perhaps provide context for what had occurred here, I quickly called out to him. Hey there! I waved as casually as possible under the circumstances. I just stumbled upon this mess. Are you okay? What happened? Rather than responding with words or showing any sign he'd heard me at all, the man dropped what he carried and strode toward me in an unnervingly predatory way. That's when panic set in as something about his demeanor suddenly seemed profoundly sinister. The moonlight revealed his features, making my blood run cold. He looked like a man who had seen far too much in life with hollow eyes that reflected a disturbing darkness, and a gaunt face sporting a vicious grin. His ragged clothing hung loosely off his skeletal frame, giving him an aura of dereliction and danger. As he moved closer, I instinctively retreated towards my truck, intending to drive away and abandon the wreckage. Before I knew it, the man lunged at me with frantic speed, Terrified, I tried to fend him off with my fists, sending a wild punch into his face. This only seemed to invigorate the strangely emaciated figure more as he grabbed hold of my arm, wrenching it in an unnatural angle. My bones screamed in agony as I swung another fist into his side in sheer desperation. Reeling from the pain, I somehow managed to break free and ran back towards my truck with every ounce of strength left in me. The man continued to chase me as I fumbled for the keys in my pocket, praying that whatever dark intentions propelled him would not come to fruition tonight. As I scrambled into the cab and shoved the key into the ignition, I noticed something on his hands that had not been there before. They were coated in blood. My heart pounded even faster as I attempted to process what sickening things this deranged individual might have done before stumbling onto the scene. Turning on the engine, tires screeching against gravel as I pulled away as fast as possible from this nightmare scenario. But he was relentless. Even after putting distance between us, I could see him managing to keep pace with my speeding truck. As I sped away from the scene, I knew that I had no choice but to call for help. My hands were shaking so badly that it took me three attempts to dial 911. When the operator answered the phone, my voice trembled as I tried to explain what had just happened. An officer was dispatched to my location, but I knew I couldn't wait there for him. I had to keep moving to put as much distance between myself and that monstrous man as possible. So, I continued driving while listening to the soothing voice of the dispatcher on the other end of the line. As soon as the officer arrived at the location where I'd initially encountered the man, I pulled over and waited for him to find me. He approached cautiously when he spotted my truck and listened intently as I recounted all of the horrifying details of the encounter. He didn't seem skeptical or doubting. In fact, there seemed to be a level of understanding in his eyes, an unsettling familiarity with this type of situation. The officer was dark-haired and stocky and billed with a few days' stubble on his chin. We've had reports of a dangerous individual matching that description causing trouble in this area, he stated matter-of-factly. His calmness helped ease some of the panic churning inside me. Thank you for calling us when you did, he told me. We'll take over from here. With that, he instructed me to stay in my truck and drove back toward the site of my near-death experience. Uneasy and desperate for confirmation that it was safe now, I followed behind at a cautious distance. As we returned to where it had all begun, the wrecked car still smoldering, blue and red lights mixed with flickering shadows cast eerie patterns on our surroundings. 
The other officers swarmed around the car, searching for clues or any trace of that deranged man who'd attacked me. However, the man was nowhere to be found. The blood I'd noticed on his hands was evident in a fresh trail leading away from the scene, disappearing into the dense forest nearby. The search continued throughout the night, but to no avail. In the days that followed, a special task force was created to bring the man to justice. I remained in close contact with local law enforcement as the investigation continued. They assured me that I'd be kept apprised of any progress they made in capturing him. Sadly, no such progress occurred. Two more victims fell prey to this sadistic stranger, an elderly couple brutally beaten within their home with bloody footprints leading away from the scene much like the ones I'd left behind that night. Their bodies were discovered days later when a neighbor noticed newspapers piling up outside their door and called for a welfare check. My chest tightened at the news of their deaths. Had it not been for my frantic retreat and desperate plea for help, it could have been my face on the evening news. Every time I drove alone on a dark road or heard an unexpected noise in my house, a shiver would run down my spine, a constant reminder of how close I came to marrying my own demise. Inevitably, life went on. That menacing grin and those hollow eyes faded to memory, replaced by ongoing sorrow for those who hadn't escaped that blood-soaked fate. The man remained at large, his motivations still baffling both investigators and residents alike, and his identity as unknown as his whereabouts. But despite all this uncertainty, one thing remained clear. We would never feel safe knowing he still roamed free among us. As years passed, people began getting on with their lives, joining neighborhood watch programs and equipping their homes with security systems always vigilant, never forgetting what had happened on that grisly night. And though the wounds of our town's past would never entirely heal, we stayed strong, bound together by the shared knowledge that surviving harrowing events had only made us more resilient in the face of pure evil. December 2006, I'd been logging long hours as a truck driver for a small company famous for transporting Delano Peppers, an unknown variety unique to our town of Patriot Hill, Indiana. My name is Arnold McLean, but people call me Mac. Suits me well enough. One beautiful day, between my dry wit and whistling my favorite tunes, my metal was put to the test when I encountered a wicked evil. My route took me along the periphery of Patriot Hill Forest, known for its dense foliage that formed a green canopy over the Tulane dirt road. Now and then I would spot deer roaming nearby or skim past the occasional hiker. That was until one particular day changed everything. As I drove on in complete darkness with only my headlights illuminating the way ahead, I noticed something unusual lying in the middle of the road. As I got closer, I brought my truck to a screeching halt. The path in front of me was completely blocked by piles and piles of red and green Delano peppers meticulously arranged as if mocking me. Raising an eyebrow at their bewildering appearance, I figured it must have been some sort of prank by bored local kids. Maybe they couldn't resist making an old man's life more eventful than it already was? Frustration seeped through my veins as I climbed out of my truck and began to remove the peppers in handfuls, throwing them to the side so I could continue on with my delivery. It seemed like it took hours to clear even half of that heap. That's when I heard it a weird scraping noise coming from behind. The hair on the back of my neck stood as I swung around, expecting some chuckling kids who had doubled back to watch their prank unfold. But there were no kids in sight, 
only one enormous man with crooked teeth glinting through his twisted grin in the faint light of my truck's high beams. The massive figure calmly approached me and murmured, Oh, how wonderful that you've found my tribute. A shiver ran through me as I took in the appearance of this unfathomable individual. His filthy clothes and long, unkempt hair indicated living in squalor, but his intense glare suggested a calculating intellect fueled by madness. Trying to keep my cool, I replied with a false bravado. Well, I hope you enjoyed your little fun because it's time for me and my truck to pass. To my surprise, a chuckle escaped him as he tilted his head back in amusement. He stared at me with piercing eyes and raised a long, twisted blade in one hand while brandishing an old revolver in the other. Mr. McLean, he said eerily calm, you seem to undermine what's happening here. I assure you it won't be that way. The next few moments were a blur, the gun cocking, the beam of my headlights catching the monstrous creases of his face as he lunged forward toward me, slice after horrifying slice whirling through the air. Panic surged through my veins as I scrambled backward towards the safety of my cab. How the hell did he know my name? How long had this man and been watching me? I knew I had only a few moments to act. Desperate, I reached for my phone, but it fell on the ground as I continued to stumble away from the maniac approaching me. The terrifying sight of his blade, revolver, and twisted smile sent all my thoughts into disarray. Without thinking further, I sprinted towards a nearby petrol station knowing that there'd be people around who could help me. Panic and fear consumed me, but somehow I managed to keep running. The insane attacker followed me closely, never seeming to tire or slow down. His cruel laughter echoed in the night air as he chased me relentlessly. I finally reached the petrol station, gasping for breath at the edge of exhaustion. Help! I screamed, catching the attention of a group of bystanders and the attendant on duty. Their shocked expressions turned into concern as they spotted the enormous figure closing in with his weapons gleaming under the harsh lights of the petrol station. Several men in the group stepped up to confront him, creating a barrier between us. The madman must have realized that things were getting out of hand and retreated into the darkness from which he came. But even as fear and adrenaline slowly subsided, his grinning face and vicious intent remained etched into my memory. We called the police immediately, who took down my statement and began investigating this terrifying attack. I expressed my gratitude to those who intervened at the petrol station. They saved my life by putting themselves between us. Their faces were full of disbelief as they tried to process what had just transpired in those horrifying moments. The unknown stranger wielding weapons of destruction to terrorize me for reasons beyond our understanding. Days later, while continuing with my deliveries for work, I thought about everything that had happened, how random and brutal it had been. How lucky I was to be alive and how someone who knew my name still eluded both me and authorities. In the meantime, life had returned to some semblance of normality. The incident had alerted the entire town, and everyone seemed more cautious and vigilant. Though I was still shaken, I couldn't stop thinking about the witnesses who had risked their lives for a person they didn't even know an act of complete selflessness that deeply moved me and gave me newfound hope. The police were unable to find any leads on my assailant. Days turned into weeks without any significant updates. Despite that, my gratitude towards the petrol station's patrons remained unwavering. My life had been spared thanks to them, and things could have ended far differently had they not intervened. The entire ordeal left a lasting impact on me. My attacker may never be found, 
but the heroism I witnessed that night changed my perspective on people. For every twisted, dangerous individual out there, there are brave souls ready to stand up against them. It's these brave souls that I'll remember and cherish as time goes on, those who restore our faith in humanity even when hope seems lost. I'm now aware that life can change in an instant. Each day is precious and unpredictable. Despite the horror that unfolded during my unfortunate encounter with a dangerous man-man, it led me to recognize the power of kindness and community, which is a lesson I'll carry with me for the rest of my days. September 2005 I was working my usual truck route, hauling freight through the dense forested area of Oregon. After driving for hours, I decided it was time for a break. I pulled up to an old gas station in the middle of nowhere and hopped out of my cab. My name's Paul Kleinfeld, by the way, and this was shaping up to be a day I'd never forget. As I was filling up my truck, I noticed something odd on the ground, several smartphone shards, with dry blood smeared on them. The scene sent chills racing through me, but my curiosity got the better of me as I continued looking around. After paying for the gas and grabbing a quick snack inside, I returned to find a young woman standing near my truck. She introduced herself as Annabelle Gates and told me she had been hitchhiking with her friends when their car broke down further ahead. Feeling sorry for her, I offered her and her friends a lift to the nearest town. She happily agreed and led me to meet the rest of her group, Jeremy Maldonado and Roxanne Wharton. The three were heading to a nearby camping spot when their car's engine blew. As we were driving through the seemingly endless forest, Jeremy began sharing increasingly horrifying stories about past crimes that occurred in this remote area of Oregon. The unsettled look on Roxanne's face told me this wasn't what they had expected for their trip. The ride continued uneventfully until suddenly a disgusting smell emerged from somewhere outside the truck. It was overpowering. Even Roxanne gagged as we struggled to breathe through our nose plugs. Trying to lighten the grim atmosphere, Jeremy played a few riddles over his portable speakers. What has keys but can't open locks? He asked. A piano! Annabelle replied with an uneasy giggle. The next one caught everyone off guard. What has a heart that doesn't beat? As we pondered the answer in silence, the truck suddenly jolted and skidded off the side of the road, snapping us back to our gruesome reality. The engine roared, struggling to regain traction as we frantically attempted to get back on track. With a final heave, we managed to start moving again. But it wasn't long until we realized that trouble awaited us down the road. The smell lingering irrepressible in the air, I continued driving with ever-growing dread. Then, in the distance, I caught a glimpse of something unnerving, a man standing by a mutilated vehicle with its flashers on. He seemed to be examining a victim, almost inhumane, the acts he inflicted upon them. It dawned on us that he might be responsible for all the sinister occurrences in this remote area. As we drove closer, I tried to look away but found it impossible not to observe his grotesque features. Clad in bloodied clothes, he towered menacingly over his victim, ultimately revealing his unbelievably thick and mangled beard. It was then when he spotted us, Jeremy's sudden shriek had alerted him. The sinister figure began sprinting towards our truck with an unexplainable speed and force. Without thinking twice, I floored it trying to escape his wrath. The truck rumbled through the desolate forest path as chaos ensued inside. Faster! Roxanne screamed, 
watching the monstrous figure catch up with alarming speed. My heart pounded harder with each passing second. Why won't this beast just give up? As we raced down the broken road, I had one mission, keep us alive and out of his reach. In a panic, I swerved the truck around the sharpest turns, navigating between twisted trees and broken branches, my hands gripping the steering wheel as if my life depended on it. Roxanne, beside me, desperately attempted to dial for help on her cell phone but found no signal. The dense forest seemed to swallow our pleas for help, and our options were running out. As the monstrous figure charged after us relentlessly, Jeremy mustered the courage to face our pursuer through the rear window. Guys, we need to do something. He's not stopping. With limited weapons or resources, but a fierce determination to survive, we continued our desperate attempt to outrun him. Annabelle rummaged through the truck's content in search of anything useful. Seizing a heavy-duty flashlight from under a seat, she smacked it across her hand a few times before passing it to me. We burst through a clearing where an abandoned cabin came into view. Hesitant but left with no choice at this point, we rushed inside and barricaded the entrance as best as we could. The minutes dragged into an eternity as we held our breaths in expectation of another attack. When nothing happened for what seemed like hours, we felt a temporary relief, accounting an escape from his clutches. We were hungry and exhausted from this harrowing experience, and took turns resting while keeping watch for any sign of danger. As night fell, darkness enveloped the cabin with only flickers of moonlight illuminating it from outside. Jeremy was staying vigilant while we rested when he heard something scratching against the walls, like metal being dragged across wood. His breathing quickened as he motioned for us to wake up. Roxanne whimpered as she clung on to me, her voice barely audible. Please, any ideas? I racked my brain for any possible solution that might save us from this persistent nightmare. My gaze fell on the dilapidated chimney and an idea emerged. That chimney, it's our only chance. We have to climb out through it. Without any other options, we immediately came to a consensus and took turns climbing up the grimy brick shaft. It felt like an eternity, but one by one, we emerged on the roof, coughing and gasping for air. The fresh air filled us with a mix of relief and renewed dread. As we carefully descended using the nearby branches of nearby trees, the sinister figure burst through the cabin door, shattering its remains. We scattered into the forest, desperately seeking cover and any semblance of safety. In that chaos, we got separated in our desperate bid for survival. I could hear Jeremy's scream in agony, followed by Roxanne's horrified cry as she stumbled upon his lifeless body, his heart ripped out, just like the mutilated victim we had spotted earlier. Annabelle and I locked eyes before dashing off in opposite directions. I couldn't bear another loss. As morning broke, I found myself at an abandoned gas station that appeared deserted for years. Desperate for help or comfort amidst this living nightmare, I rummaged through the dilapidated building to find something. The phone lines were down, but found a functioning radio transmitter inside a dusty cabinet. Under extreme duress and urgency, I contacted local law enforcement and pleaded for aid while fighting off tears as I recounted my friend's gruesome fate. The police arrived shortly after my agonizing wait that seemed to stretch for decades. After questioning and comforting me simultaneously, they launched a manhunt for the deranged killer still roaming these woods. They assured me that he would be caught, that no one else would suffer at his hands. I couldn't shake Jeremy and Roxanne's memory from my mind, friends taken from us too soon in a brutal fashion. 
their sacrifice would not be forgotten. As I sat in the back of the squad car, surveying the ominous forest, I clenched the heavy-duty flashlight tightly and silently vowed that such a horrifying fate would never darken my life again.